Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filstered make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Are you a professional looking for a reliable and high-quality rifle suppressor? Look no further than Primary Arms Government, whether you're equipping a team or shopping for your personal rifle. Primary Arms Government offers a complete selection of field-proven suppressors with options to fit any rifle and any budget. They work directly with the industry's leading brands to secure the best prices and available inventory, and their expert staff is always available to answer any questions you may have. Don't compromise on the safety and effectiveness of your equipment. Choose Primary Arms Government for all your suppressor needs. Visit them online today at Primary primaryarms.com slash government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. My God, look at all those handguns since the last time I saw you on here. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> it's like an infection. It just grows if you don't do anything about it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Mine have um, been going the other direction. What was that? My guns have been going the other direction. Is it because just lack of space? Uh, no, I sold a bunch of them to buy land. <laughs> oh yeah. So that reminds me. Okay. So some of the stuff that you've gone through, absolutely fascinating. So, uh, water power. What are other topics? Uh, Con sanitation, sanitation, a big one. Yeah. Water power, sanitation, access. Uh, yeah, ac access is a big one. Weather is another huge one. Being aware of it well enough in advance to make sure you don't die. <laughs> because that's real. Yeah. A, 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 kind of different from what you just came from. Yeah. It's... Though it still was where you were living. It was a little... I wouldn't say it's desolate, but it was a little bit more remote than a lot of other areas. Yeah, it, it definitely was somewhat remote and it was hard to live there up to a point. Yeah. But nothing like this. Like I could go, I could go a day there without watching the weather here. I don't go a single day without checking the weather, Chad. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I probably check my weather station, like my actual weather station that I set up here probably 10 times a day. I mean, it's just that important. Oh, this is going to be good. Um, and then at some point, probably talk about something with arm or something with cans. Yeah, whatever you um, want. And hopefully, 
if we if if things work out, we uh, Dwayne Liptak may might join us. Oh, cool! And he's always fun. Um, and then also Hop and Brass Facts might be joining us. So here's what I here's what I'm seeing with those two guys, with with Brass and Hop, mm-hmm. um, younger YouTube guys, really sharp. Their content, I think, is I, I really like their stuff. It's just hey, we're shooting this stuff. This is what we're seeing. And I, I, I like it. It's enjoyable. But at the same time, also, I see with what you do and what they do, I see that there could definitely be some kind of a collaboration at some point if that was something you guys ever wanted to do. Especially, yeah. I could see easily going to your place because Brass lives in the Salt Lake area. Um, Hop comes out here. He's in Oregon. and He comes over here for video shoots. And I was saying, how cool would that be like if we went over to Gary's place and put together an AK or did some ballistic something or anything? That'd just be cool. Yeah. Because that kind of stuff is just so much fun. So Yeah. And eventually I'll get my shop set back up. Everything's kind of in a state of disarray yeah. here still. But, and some stuff's broke and, you know, I, don't, oh. I haven't even to turn my lathe and mill on. You can see that hydraulic press behind me. Yeah. My wife stacked some tables on it and I didn't know it over the winter. And then when I went back out to move the stuff into the shop, I mean, it was, it was literally sitting outside cause we got caught so flat footed. Yeah. And the whole frame on the bottom is just oh. bent and you know, it's going to take a lot of work to kind of get that. I may end up just buying a new piece of equipment to replace that one. Yeah. But, you know, we've got still a ton of work ahead of us, but I'm hoping that this winter, you know, cause things are slowing down kind of outside, outside of my regular livestock chores, which are every, that's every day, you know, yeah. it takes up a lot of time, but <clears throat> now things are slowing down to the point a little bit outside. Like she's not telling me to go put up a fence. Mm-hmm. You know, she's, she, things are, are getting to the point where we're able to work on the house a lot more Yeah, and get shop more organized. You know, like I went to town today to drop her off at the airport. And I went by Home Depot and bought some stuff to help me organize the shop a little better and, you know, just get things kind of a little more settled in because I've literally been living out of boxes for two years almost now, you know, at this point. So, but it's definitely better than it was. Yeah. Well, and it shows. You know, a lot of people, that's something else that I think people, they go buy a trailer or an RV and they think that's their, that's their emergency preparedness plan you know for a while i was that guy and i can tell you right now that that is planning to fail (laughs) oh wow so i just added to the list expectation versus reality yeah (laughs) yeah yeah i've become quite fond of that um that mantra that there's uh there's theory and there's practice yeah (laughs) and uh i've having having the knowledge of theory is great yeah but until you've put it in practice you really don't have any idea what is going to happen and that's come back to bite me in the ass a few times here you know if you think about it it, it, it's so appealing the whole idea of going to go out live in the wilderness and this well do you realize how much work is involved in that yeah i I don't i don't think anybody does and i i know that i knew it was going to be a lot of work but i didn't have any idea you know just like today, for example, my entire day here today was doing chores before dawn, trying to get the animals fed and everything in order to take Sandy to the airport. Took Sandy to the airport, hit a couple of shops like, you know, Home Depot or whatever I needed yeah. to do. Came back, got fuel, came home. It was time to do all the animal chores again. Yeah. I did all that. I got the night fires ready to go. You know, I started heating up the shop because I knew I was going to be out here doing this. And literally here we are. Like I... I had enough time to take a shower and that's, and that's it. Jeez. So it definitely takes a lot more time than I think people realize. Yeah. You know, and it was more so this winter when I was a hundred percent in just straight up survival mode, you know? Yes. Yeah. And between still trying to work full time, you know, and take work calls and do work trips and, you know, last year going to SHOT Show, I got pardoned from SHOT Show this year. So that mm. was nice. I received a, Wait a minute. reprieve. So is this the first time you've had this reprieve for how long? 
uh, since I got COVID one year. So I okay. had, uh, um, and, and then they canceled it one year. So yep. there was two years in a row. I didn't go. Then I had to go again. And then this year I got a reprieve. I mean, they, they pretty much all know that I hate the shot show <laughs> with every fiber of my being. And so they were like, well, who doesn't want to go? And they're like, oh, Gary doesn't want to go. Let, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think that was. People were volunteering you to not go. That says yeah. a lot. Yeah. For the first year I missed it, I think it was 23 years in a row or something I had gone. So wow. it was a good long stretch. And it's like they, they messaged me and they were like, do you care if you don't go? And I said, I don't care if I ever go again. Yeah. <laughs> So, Somebody Brass else. is here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Matt pushed very hard for me to come to this one. I'm a little toasted, but I'll, I'll do my best. Still? From, <laughs> just from the from the last podcast we just did a couple nights ago? Come on. I'm kidding. That was Tuesday, right? Who yeah, knows? that was Tuesday. I don't know. I blacked out at some point uh, about one and a half hours in, and then I... Get, uh... You were great. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a very fun episode. Um, um, uh, went off the walls on that one. No, 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 no. Oh, I, I, think, I think everyone... <laughs> you and Hop, I thought, were great. I thought you guys, you guys were a lot of fun. A lot of the points you guys made were, were just... It was just... The whole episode was fun. Speaking Hop rents are fun, great. Yeah. Oh, they are. They are. Um Speaking of fun, though, so I was talking to Gary about, hey, what you, I've been I've been wanting to get him on to talk about what he's been going through. He already has the background in ballistics. He already has a background in armor, suppressors, all that kind of stuff. Wait a minute, how cool would it be to get these guys together with Gary? This is a cool networking opportunity. Is Hoss yeah. even coming? I don't actually know if he's coming or not. Uh, oh, I, I I rely on his secretary. Yeah, well, when, I don't he have any... wanna, when he doesn't want to talk to me, he ignores the secretary as well. So, oh, I, I, gotcha. I, See, if I had his number, I'd just call him or text, and then he can ignore me too. Um, I'll see if I can get him. If, I don't think he's gonna. He's not gonna respond, but I can at least try. Um, so, Gary was in. You were past Parley's. You were in the Park City ish area. I was in Heber. Yeah. yeah. And so now you're in the middle of nowhere. Yep. About 25 miles outside Evanston. Evanston. Where's that again? Yeah. Oh, this is a Utah podcast. Never mind. This is this is way better. Get, don't, get, don't get the Oregon boy in here. <laughs> well, now now Gary's uh, Wyoming, though. Yeah, Utah's just eastern Oregon now. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting worse. time zone uh, as well on east. It's two time zones. Utah swung too far left for me. I had to leave. And that's just in Salt Lake and it's growing. Well, you were in yeah. Heber, right? That, that, yeah. that I remember because uh, I went to high school in Park City. I remember Heber used to kind of be a shit, like not a shithole, but like very much a backwater place. And then in the span of like 15 years, it's like Park City too. Yeah, it became the place. Well, it's kind of like Jackson up here. It became the place where, you know, the, the millionaires that lived in Park City got pushed out by the billionaires that moved to Park City. And they moved to Heber yeah. and ruined it. Yeah, so, when you come in on the right, those houses came out of nowhere. I, I did my driver's ed in Heber, and then I showed up like five years later, and it's just tons of just really expensive housing. Yeah, it happened really fast. That's for sure. So I just sent out something to hop, not that he's going to see it, message or anything. Um so Brass, you've been primarily doing rifle stuff. You've been doing optic stuff. You've been doing laser and night vision stuff. Like reviews wise? Yeah, yeah. I actually have a, it's funny you brought on. Uh, I, I just did a suppressor video called What They Don't Tell You About Suppressors. Oh, cool. It's a, it's, it's a, it talks a little bit more about not the sound component proximal to the shooter, which is a big focus in the industry right now especially with stuff like Pew Science, right? That, that's really all it is about sound proximal to the shooter. And it talks about sound performance downrange, 100, 200, 300, 400 yards, the effect of so subsonic booms on how you interpret sound, how sound works in a valley, and then a flash signature with and without night vision, and then thermal signature of different types of suppressors like double walled, uh, monocore, uh, flow through designs and how they handle um, 
large amounts of ammunition through them and how that signature may look downrange. So a big one that everyone is losing, as Hop says, losing their come over is uh, the Flow 556 Huxworks can. Yeah. Great can in a lot of aspects, but um, really kind of comes up short in the um, the thermal signature. Not, not like with a thermal device, but thermal signature being turned to heat, turned to light for night vision. That thing lasts about 60 rounds before it is, is light, light, uh, blah, blah, blah. brighter than a um, an infrared illuminator head on. Uh, you'll mm. see a bigger dot than a laser illuminator. It's, it'll be about like, you know, like one degree, but you know, you're under nods and everything looks gray, uh, mono scale. And then you just have this dot dancing around on the hillside 300 yards away. And you're like, oh, that's a, that's a Hux can. Uh, it's not just Hux. It's not just Hux, by the way, like tons of, um, monocore uh cans like the uh, the one i used was the omega 300 right it's not technically a monocore but it's basically uh elmer's glue and a core uh strapped together so it's essentially one material uh versus the um you know uh, the, the one we used was the dead air the rc2 and then a number of other cans and those have like a very thin from what i understand i saw a cutout that i Shamelessly stole from. I don't know where I got it from, but there's you can see a small air gap with more traditional can designs, and that seems because air is the ultimate insulator, you know, unless we could get a vacuum in there. Uh, so it ends up keeping those cans really cool. Practically speaking, under semi-auto, we found you can't really get those cans hot enough for it to matter. That's cool stuff. Yeah. So that was that was the video. Um, we'll we'll see. I'm not a huge suppressor guy. I'm just like buy a damn suppressor. Just just get a suppressor. Stop being that guy at the range. Go get yeah. lead. Get, go get lead poisoning. Go get covered in back pressure. Get, have your face turned into a disgusting thing. Just just get a can. We'll we'll see how the suppressor guy uh, <laughs> thinks about that. So I'm, I'm very inexperienced. I had to talk to some size shop guys um, to kind of confirm certain things, like because I have suspicions. Well, I can put that very simply for you. Cans that have a lot of metal in them take longer to heat up, but once mm -hmm. they get hot, they stay hot longer. Yeah. It's thermal mass. I mean, it's yeah. that simple. So when you have a can, like a lot of the new flow through designs or the OSS or Huxworks or whatever the fuck they call it these days, um, they get hot and they stay hot. Mm -hmm. And that was always one of the big issues with them. Yeah, for sure. That's not new. That's, 15 right. years ago or whatever, you know, at this point. Yes. So, there's uh there's certainly some people, people have started good. caring about, you know, the flow through cans. Um, whereas before they were sort of a novelty and I, I won't be buying one anytime soon. I can tell you that because I don't care about three or 400 yards downrange performance. Um, I am a consumer. I'm a civilian shooter. And I don't give a shit about what it sounds like at a hundred yards. I want it to sound good to me. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of times the consumer market thinks that way, unless you're, I don't know, how did I phrase it the other day? A SOCOM panty sniffer. Um, then you, you know, go after whatever they want. You don't know what you want. You just want what they have. And you, you don't know, know why. Hmm? And you don't know why. Yeah. And you don't know why. So you're just deferring to whatever the cool guys use and they, and they do that. But, you know, the more you, I, I, at least for me, I've, I'm becoming an old man in the suppressor <laughs> thing yeah. now. Um, and frankly, my tastes on it have much more swung to, I don't give a shit about yeah. this and this and this, I want this to do this thing. And I'm perfectly willing to get a suppressor or silencer to do that one thing and put it on that one gun. And I'm not trying to, do this broad range of things with them, you know, anymore. I do. Uh, and, and frankly, I, pr I probably am not going to purchase any more quick detach, fast attach cans. I'm probably going to use direct thread um, or something similar to like Q's, you know, muzzle device attachments where they're threaded to a, a muzzle device that I don't have to remove from the gun. Um, but the QD thing adds a lot of weight and it adds zero benefit if you're not moving it around on a lot of guns, which I don't. Yeah. And a lot of them are very much quick attach only, and then you need a tool to get the damn thing off. Yeah. And, or you shoot it off. Right. Yeah. But, for me. Uh, oh, I was just going to say for me, cans, I just want to have suppression on my side. I don't care. I want it to have, be as close to hearing safe and that that's not possible. 
that, is, that I can, especially for work. I want the people around me so we can hear better. Mm. I, I don't want to be blasting yeah, out. And, and, and all of that stuff, you know, and the, and the flow through stuff is, is nice. And I think that as the technology matures, cause I don't think it's mature yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's still very much uh, in its infancy. And that may very well be the thing that people move forward with, especially as company like Knights and Surefire and, you know, they all adopt those things and people will just blindly do what they say. Um, and to some degree they've earned that. Um, there's, you know, I remember when the Marine Corps went to the Knights NT4, what a perfect can. I mean, it's an old design. It's heavy. It's a brick. You know, that's the closest thing to a rock in the silencer market that there is. I mean, they should probably replace the little, thing that comes in the MRE that says elevate on a rock or something. They should probably put an NT4 there, but what a perfect can for that application. Yeah. You know, and it's a great can. It's a classic can. It's not, it looks cool. it's not sexy. It's not got any of those things, but frankly, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, it has to do the job that you intend it to do and fit the application that you intend it to fill and go from there. And I think that, you know, having, worked for and built two of the largest silencer companies in the world for the consumer side um, from the ground floor on both of them and involved in pretty much every aspect of the business. I can tell you that there's a lot more art than there is silence in, or than there is science in the silencer. Mm. Industry. Um, and the guys that are doing these things do not have the educational technical background to know what they're doing a lot of times. Um, a lot of that stuff is trial and error. And now, you know, as you get companies, like I said, with Knights and, you know, some of the other ones, they're hiring guys. But, you know, I, to me, one of the sleeper brands out there and probably the smartest guys in the silencer business right now is Energetic Arm, Energetic Arm. Those guys are legit science guys. They're materials guys. They're tech guys. And are their cans super quiet? No, because... They build it to a metric. They say, we want to achieve this goal and they build yeah. it there and then they put it out, you know? And, and I like that. I admire that. They're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, they're trying to put out a product that meets the design metrics and, and specifications that they envisioned and they build it and they put it out. And frankly, I've got one of their cans now and I'm probably buying a couple more because they're that they're simple. Yeah. You know, and I, and I understand it and I don't have to have a QD mount on it. And you know, that they're kind of one of the sleeper brands, I think in the industry right now. And you watch some of these guys that go design cans and uh, they don't follow any kind of scientific method or process. And they start making so many changes. And this is the art side because they're artists, not scientists. And they make, five changes and then they test it and then something happened and they don't know exactly what did what, and there's no way to quantify it, you know, and that's the case more often than people would know, you know, I mean, they, they just have no idea about how those things get designed. And they think that there's a lot of science and work and it's not, it's trial and error and it's art. And then it's based on experience, you know, that, that you, you arrive at these things. And you look at some companies like, I mean, OSS is a perfect example. If Russ Oliver didn't beta test his fucking customer, nobody ever did. You know, I mean, that's, that's the facts. So I don't know. It's the, the cans, the can market right now is uh, very much a marketing market. Yeah. I've heard that a lot about the, uh, the trial and error of just having a CAD drawing, essentially like a solid works drawing of a can and a CNC machine and just shoving shit through the, uh, the machine until a can kind of sounds nice to the sound meter. Cause like the, the way, at least I, I haven't done can stuff, but I've done engineering stuff and like the way fluid dynamics works and, and stuff like that is well understood, but you need a, it's a fluid dynamics is one of the hardest things you can possibly do just because of the infinite complex nature of fluids, right? You, you have to, you have to basically apply uh, models to reduce it in complexity, unless you have, you know, the Google supercomputer or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, but I, I, I won't pretend to know how fluid dynamics would, you know, play out in practice on a development process for suppressors. But I, I imagine they're, 
it probably doesn't match what the suppressor industry is doing right now, at least from from what I saw in the designs uh, I've seen. Right. Because ultimately, that's that's what you're doing. Right. You're trying to make it more turbulent, high volume. Uh, you're basically trying to get gas to go from a high energy state to a low energy state and stuff like that. So that's just all just fluid dynamics, which I got a terrible grade. in, by the way, worst <laughs> class of my life, uh, I would never want to hear the word laminar flow ever again. Uh, I think the high in that class was a 25 or 30. Um, I wrote my name on the test. And when you consider the curve, like my name did more work than the entire study session uh, and, and my answer. Oh, that class fucked my day up. At least you're honest. Well, I, Gary's the first person that brought up to me talking about the, the overall sound. And I don't, I wish I could. Yeah. And I wish yeah, I could that's... remember what the, what the discussion was. Ultimately we wound up also talking about the, what are they? The flash caps. Yeah, flash hiders, flash hider front caps. Yeah, yeah. But talking about the overall tone, I thought, what the, I never even thought about that. That's really cool. That's stuff a, that, that that was kind of like a hop theory of mine because we were initially we were getting into cans like pretty heavily. Like we we finally built up enough cans to actually begin to compare stuff, and it's like, well, we we can see online metrics of which cans should be quieter than which can, and. A lot of times that doesn't play out because tone seems to matter, at least for how humans perceive sound as much, if not more. I mean, maybe it's not related, but isn't nine mil technically louder than rifles uh, at the at the muzzle or something like that? But we don't perceive it and it falls off faster. I, I'm not 100 percent sure about that one. But tone like is a big one. Like the RC2 is technically not a quiet can. Like it's it's about mid tier, but it sounds so damn good that a lot of people perceive it as a really quiet can. I don't know. I'm I'm just talking with anecdotal bullshit though. So no, and that's and that's accurate. I mean, there's a lot of cans that don't meter great that sound good, um, you know, to the to the human ear. But I don't give a fuck about the meter. Yeah, I'm not buying the can for the meter. I'm not buying it for internet social credit points, you know, or whatever. I'm buying it for me to use. Mm. And all I care about is that it sounds good. And yeah. anything that's, you know, overboard, essentially, 5.56 five, through a 30 bore is going to have a lower base ear tone than anything that has something closer to an exit aperture that's, you know, bore sized. Um, they're going to have a higher pitch, a higher tone. And sometimes you can affect the tone with materials too. Titanium has kind of a high pitch to it, a ring, when you use an all TI can. They just, they they do that. Um you know, and that's kind of been a known thing around the consumer circles for, for quite some time. And I don't, I don't put much stock. I, I don't even look at the meter numbers anymore. Frankly, I don't give a shit about any of that stuff. I, I need to hear it myself. I need to shoot it. It was really cool kind of in the early days of mainstreaming of silencers because so many dealers did demos yeah. You know, and you would go outside and you'd shoot one and you'd hear it. Yeah. And you get to do that. And I think as they've become more and more popular and there's more and more YouTube videos and there's all this stuff and people just kind of buy things um, sight unseen or, or sound unheard, mm -hmm. you know, in this instance. And then they end up with a lot of buyer's remorse, especially guys that buy dedicated 556 five, cans for whatever reason. I think most of that buyer's remorse is not that they're unhappy with their can. I mean, there are some cases where that happens. It's that they're, they look at some reports online and they're like, wait, my can doesn't do good. And then they get the buyer's remorse. Uh, I've, I've heard that be a pretty big issue, unfortunately. So it's like well, review induced buyer's remorse. I get that as a reviewer, by the way, like no shit hop. You can, maybe you can take this point, but like 50% of our views are people that already own the product. They're like, oh, I want to see how good my, uh, yeah. Nothing Fancy's been complaining about that ever since the beginning of his channel. He's like, you guys always ask me to review stuff, but I know that when you ask me to review it, it's because you already have it. You're looking for validation. So just seeing people say, please review the XYZ product, that doesn't mean people want to see a review of that product. It means that somebody already bought it and just wants to see your opinion. Want they they want that validation. And then they should, they uh, they spend the entire like comment section like, Good review. Oh, yeah. God bless. God bless my cracks. And then uh, you you do a negative review and it's like, look, this motherfucking posing, LARPing. I got some of those today. I, I just tell people don't buy a cake can. I learned that lesson. I did too. And that's pretty much all I use. Why? See, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't mind cake cans. It, it depends like what the goal is, but... Um, 
yeah, like for five, five, six, for example, I, I mean, Gary can speak to this better, but at least for me, um, you know, I'm wearing hearing protection with some of these, like, it, it depends on the gun, right? Like if it's a longer gun, I don't want a Sandman S on the end of my gun. My, that poor Sandman S is, 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 is the dude from, um, Green Mile, like, please boss. Please, I can't do no more. The thing weighs 24 ounces. I can't get the carbon fucking out of it. No one picks up my call. The end cap is permanently like smashed into the end of the gun because it's been smashed into the ground too many times. We tried the pipe wrench thing, the, the thing off. Putting that on an 18 inch gun makes me want to just end it all. Uh, so I love K-cans for stuff like that. And um, yeah, the, the Flow 556 has been pleasant, especially when you have EarPro on. That thing without EarPro kind of sucks, but I don't know. Everything without EarPro sucks. I haven't ruined, ruined my hearing yet, so I don't know. That, that's my point of view. Well, again, it, it depends on the application. You know, if I'm going to go shoot all afternoon, yeah, then I'm probably not going to leave a K-Can on there. I might switch to an S or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that, but that's that's not how I primarily use cans anymore. I primarily use cans because I'm going to shoot something and kill it. So like um, one to two shots, right? Yeah. And I don't care about it. I mean, yeah. and my hearing's already so fucked from working on guns and cans and everything for my entire career. I just, I have permanent constant tinnitus. Yeah. And uh, it, it just, it, my main criteria for the K can is that it's below my pain threshold. So does it actually physically hurt mm. when I hear it? Um, and it doesn't when I shoot like a Sandman K, I use a Sandman K on probably 80% of the guns I run around here right now. Um, and it's below my pain threshold. I know that it's not hearing safe. I'm going to fire one or two rounds or whatever at a coyote or, you know, whatever, a badge or whatever. And that's that. And it's not a pain in my ass and it's easy for me to maneuver in and around vehicles and, yeah. you know, all of those. Small enough to be not a pain in your ass. Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly. I think people also <laughs> kind of freak out over just like the, what happens if there's a, a single unsuppressed gunshot to my ears one time, I'll go deaf, but that's it. Cause I, hearing I, loss, I've guys covered this before I, before I got to this, before I got here, but hearing damage is cumulative. So like, there's the idea that vacuuming your house without ear protection is worse for you than an unsuppressed gunshot because you're exposed to a sound above safe levels for 40 minutes at a time. Same thing with mowing the lawn. If you have a loud lawn mower and you spend an hour mowing the lawn with no hearing protection, it's a lot worse than an unsuppressed gunshot. So I, I, I need to wear ear pro when I vacuum? Gary most, probably has 20 and not a lot of ear pro. Like you can just do like, yeah. Built in. <laughs> most adults in the US have left side tinnitus to some degree. And you know what it's from? Their wives. Nope. Oh. Driving so, with your window down. Okay. Interesting. And it's it's that, cumulative, it's that cumulative effect, that that noise. And it happens on that left side. So, you know, that's you can get down into the nitty gritty of that, but when you have somebody who's that worried about it, well, firearms are dangerous. They're dangerous to other people, they're dangerous to you. And they are hazardous to your health. You're gonna inhale lead. Yeah, tons inhale of it. all sorts of toxic shit. Guess what? This might not be the game for you. That's right. That's right. And I did say that out of just, um, Sandy, I know you're, you're there. <laughs> so I don't know if you, if you kind of talked about this as well, but like, to me, the, if this is about uh, silencers and stuff, I have no idea. I got here late. I was busy. Oh, we just started sanding, talking. sanding some metal off of my AK. Uh, but yeah, it's like to me, 99% of the suppressor experience is, how are the mounts? How is the overall weight, you know, and the length of the package? Uh, how are how is the muzzle device ecosystem? Because everybody's going to have multiple guns they want to mount the same suppressor to, so they're going to be buying multiple muzzle devices. So are you going to be able to find good muzzle devices? If their muzzle breaks, do they have to be timed? Because then you have to time them properly with shims, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I really liked the YHM SRX system that they came out with because the muzzle brakes are neutrally ported. They suck as muzzle brakes. They're terrible. They have like almost no braking effect compared to like some modern high performance brakes. But neutrally ported, you just crank them on. Rock set if you don't, if you want it, or if you don't, it doesn't matter. It's a dual taper system, the same as uh, Plan B. That's a the user experience of the SRX system is awesome. I don't think that those brakes probably reduce sound as much as like more restrictive brakes because they don't create as much turbulence or whatever. And the YHM cans, I'm sure, are not the quietest of the you know cans because they're all very old designs. 
But if you have those cans with that system, you're going to have a very enjoyable user experience to be able to find all the muzzle devices you want, put them on all your guns, attach the can easily. It's not going to get carbon locked. Like that will be a good can for you because the end result is either it's hearing safe or it's not hearing safe. If you're shooting 5.56, five, you're using hearing protection anyway because it's fucking loud even with a can. And if you're shooting 300 black subs, doesn't matter. It's it's going to be totally fine. So the, the difference in a half a decibel, one decibel, two decibels, that will never matter to you probably. But every time you have to take the can off and put the can on a different gun, and if you've got a, a shitty mount system that wobbles, you might have a zero shift. Like there's all those little things that will ruin your experience with the suppressor and a decibel here or there is not, it's not that. No, people who chase numbers um, are frequently disappointed. I feel like a young, but like, like I, I'm shooting my uh, TP9 with the can that's larger than my, you know, full-size dog. And I still get like, I feel uncomfortable doing that without hearing protection. So yeah, I guess I'm just a little sensitive bitch. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> well, my uh, my Resonator K is like, you know, that's my version of your Sandman, but at least your Sandman makes stuff quieter. Whereas the, the Resonator K has no effect on volume that I can determine uh, and also doesn't re reduce flash at all. So that thing was it, flashing and bro. I, know, I just, I just put that on guns so I can feel like a suppressor owner, even though I'm pretty sure legally it's basically as much a suppressor as a, as a Novesky flaming pig is like, there's just, it's not doing shit. What is with suppressors and night vision? We get all excited to spend all this money on night vision and then low key, they kind of just ruin all of our shit. Cause now we're going to buy like printer ink. Oh, sorry. Uh, muzzle devices for suppressors. Um, and then we need to, you know, put this heavy weight on the end of our gun. And then the back pressure gives us gun aids. And it's the same with night vision. You know, we spend all this money on night vision. And then, ah, Christ, this D2 weighs more than my entire gun. You put that on the end of the month. No, I'm, I'm just fucking. But it's 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 just funny how uh, how that ends up playing out. It's like it's that's my justification for buying for buying a budget can. You know, I saved money buying my Resonator K. And then I took all of that money that I saved and I bought like 30 different Reardon flash hiders and brakes it literally is printer ink <laughs> i could have bought a more expensive suppressor but then i wouldn't have had all these flash hiders direct yeah. thread really sounds so much more appealing which is kind of why i'm moving towards it like i, I I'm, I'm happy i started with dead air that was absolutely the call you know five seven years of running one can um and having like six guns like that's a big deal for me right but i'm finally getting to the point where i'm you know basically a drug addict i'm fully involved in the system you know I, I can i can afford to start dedicating cans to guns yeah well and that's that's the difference in an entry-level consumer and somebody who's more advanced and got experience with them you know and and the that feature set that that entry-level consumer is looking for i mean yeah it Absolutely. should rightly be different than what the advanced user is looking for mm -hmm. i have an yes, entire sir. safe behind me full of cans um and i use like six of them yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's the way it is with everything. How many of those guns behind you do you shoot Matt regularly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe five at the most. Yeah. Those are so, guns. I thought that was a fancy poster. It is. No, it's airsoft guns. Remember? Yeah. Green screen. The left side is all airsoft. The right side is actually just a poster that he hung up on the wall. That's right. Yeah. But as you, as you gain experience with it, you sort of figure out what's important to you. And that's going to be different for everybody. Um, you know, then I'm not in any position to say any more than anybody else is what's right for somebody else. I could just tell you what's right for me. Um, and it's probably very different than some other people. I know it is, you know, the, the thing with the K cans, for example, you know, some guys absolutely feel like they've got to have the quietest can out there. And I don't, you know, for me, the size, the weight, it, you know, those things are far more important, less back pressure, you know, like when, when the reports came out about this new Surefire flow through can and how yeah. flashy it was when you changed the muzzle device. And I'm like, well, no shit. Who doesn't think that if you change the internal structure via the muzzle device inside the silencer, that something is going to change. Yeah. Um, that's, it's ridiculous to think that something wouldn't change, you know, for a long time, guys were buying muzzle brakes instead of flash hiders because they wanted to use it as a sacrificial blast baffle. Cause we mm -hmm. were, melting in canal, you know, blast baffles left and right. So, but all of that stuff changes it. Changing the end cap 
on the can can affect the flash and they have muzzle brakes for the front, which, you know, those, those things are way less effective at that end of the gun than they are at the, at the other end of the gun at the, at the muzzle end, but they, they do have an impact. So I don't know how you could change something and to just see the internet hand wringing over the fact that something changed when they changed the muzzle device. And I'm like, well, no shit, dumbass. You know, I mean, what are you thinking? Yeah, it's going to change things if you do can't things like that. And I don't know. I get I get really fed up with the marketing side of the of the industry as a whole, not just in silencers, but in armor and everything else. You know, I get I get really fed up with it because right now, I would say the last 15 years, the marketeers run this industry, not the designers, not the sales guys, not the, you know, the the marketeers run it. And it's really been to the detriment of the entire industry, frankly. You know, we kind of discussed that in the airing of grievances, talking about the sales to the wholesalers versus to the consumer. There's, I kind of see a similarity with that discussion. Do you guys remember? Yeah. Or yeah. were you too drunk? Come on. Uh, no, I blacked out. But I'm sure someone remember. I'll get but drunk enough soon that I'll that like that. You know, you know how you have like two like subconscious and the conscious. Like okay, but there's. I an wasn't actually on that episode. That was my stunt double. He's much more polarizing than me. I actually like everybody, and I respect all of their opinions. The uh, there's a really interesting theory. This is going to get into some nerd shit about okay. why industries go towards um, design or um, uh, marketing driven over design driven. I think I think it's called like the uh, Xerox theory, or the um, it's got a bunch of different names. But essentially, John Romero like, theory: design is law. So something like Apple comes out, right? Dicotonic Apple's came out. fighting tooth and nail to get their market share, but then they become so good, and the same issue happened with Xerox, they become so good and um, that they, they cannot increase market share by making a better product. So how do you make, drive profit? Because you always have to grow in this economy. How do you drive profit? Marketing. How do you drive profit? Optimization of the, the, the production line which usually means cost cutting. Uh, how do you drive profit? You know, um, you know, cutting out a middleman, whatever, right? Designers don't do that. That's not the designer's job. So at first you get a little bit more marketing guys on the board and then you get more marketing guys on the board and they're the ones driving profit, not the designer nerd discovering that, holy shit, we can use precipitate hardened metal instead, right? Like they don't care. Like you've already maxed out on market cap basically. So it's the, the marketing guys that can actually increase market cap. So they get more and more leverage on the board meetings, on the, you know, you know, um, uh, like useful positions, right? This, this guy brought us in 10% more profits. Now he's in charge of this division. And you do that long enough and you get a company that was a design driven company. I think Apple is the ultimate like thing. Like Steve Jobs was just turbo autistic about design, right? Like I want the inside of this iPhone yeah. to look amazing, even though no one will ever see it, right? Yeah. You know, just whatever you say about Steve Jobs, he is a an extreme design guy, maybe not an engineer. Like he's, he's definitely not an engineer, but he's a design driven guy. And you can see this in tons of companies. You see this in video games a lot. Um, you see it in a ton of things where, you know, those people take over the company and then 10, 20 years down the line, even though this company was amazing, it's a shell of its former self because all of the design people have been driven out of the decision-making process or they no longer have a majority, you know, position. They're not. Yeah. So I don't know if that's, particularly happened on the firearm side, but it is a theory that does seem to match, you know, where, where, where we've been. And I don't know the fact that we do see up some see like, wow, that this product used to rock and now it sucks. I think no, that's you how do. you get a product like the Apple three. I think it was the Apple three, which, which Steve jobs insisted had no cooling fans because he thought that the sound of a fan was like unattractive and not cool. He's like, this should be a sleek and and beautiful, quiet machine, like a, like a piece of, you know, like a, like an appliance. It should be beautiful like an appliance, not gross and nerdy like a computer. So he insisted it had no cooling system, and then it would heat up, and the chips would pop off the board, and the official well, that, fix that, that's from the Apple. That's the reverse, yeah. Yeah, the official fix from Apple was, yeah, you got to take your, your computer, you got to lift it up six inches or five inches, something like that, like a small amount off the desk, just a tasteful amount, and then drop it to reseat the chips. What? And, uh, I believe that was before Steve Jobs left Apple for the first time. And then throughout the, you know, part of the 90s, their computers were way better and nobody bought them. 
And then he came back and he introduced the Apple, the famous Macintosh, the one with the transparent colored cases that looked like a Game Boy Color. Oh, those right? things. Oh, that's my childhood right there. Right. Uh, yeah. Those are terrible machines and they sold like fucking hotcakes. And then that was that's Apple ever since then. So there you go. Well, it's not in the, the perfect, 90s. Apple for a while in the, the 90s. Perfect example to yeah, stop. for a can we, we go back design to nice was hop? Law. Stop. Let, like, let well, I can tell you start. this. I can tell you this. If you work in the gun industry and your new marketing guy comes in and he's wearing a flat brim hat, a Dixon flannel, and Chuck Taylors, it's time to find a new fucking job. Go somewhere else. That's yep. it. The game is fucking over. I only know what half of those were. Can you repeat that one more time? So flannels are... That's good. I think I, have, I think I have a hat like that. Flat brim hat, Dixon flannel, Chuck Taylor shoes. What the fuck is a Dixon flannel? Go look it up. You'll oh, see. Dixon. I thought you said Dix and flannel. Like <laughs> Yeah, so Dix and flannel. Yeah. No, that's my central Utah twang coming out. You can't understand me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a real Utah person, so like forgive me. Uh is a flat brim hat a specific kind of hat, or is it just a hat that hasn't been smushed yet? Because wow, I have this, I just... the Sea Doos hat that Sea Doos, the YouTuber, sent me. And I never got around to squishing the bone. Oh, squish it. Well, yeah, that's flat. how hats work. I'm keep not gonna flat. like. I'm not gonna T-Rex arm squishes. I'm just gonna do a normal amount of squish. That's insane. I wrote Dixon uh, yeah, flannel, cannot, and cannot the image is a dude in flannel with a mustache, with the with the thick rimmed glasses, and a flat fucking hat. And it's Gary Hughes. Old, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't ever say that about me again. I know where you live. I know where he you knows live. where I live. Well, wow, this is the worst hat I've ever worn. I'm, I'm about to get some real uh, downrange signature about this suppressor here. <laughs> you can't yeah. talk about. Yeah, that's a that's a shame that that's happening, but it's yeah. definitely happening to the entire industry, and it's probably going to continue to happen. Yep, that's. And the sad thing is, it it seems like most industry that the result of it is, well, that wow, you look like a lesbian. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to to set the uh, the dress code set by Mr. Landfair. That's right. I don't own a hat. Fuck. They keep giving to me at shot show. I can't fucking get rid of them. Like it's it's a pile that's growing. I'm trying to do the hop thing. So hop, obviously, he's with TFB, so he goes to all these stupid events. Um, so he keeps getting swag and swag and swag, and it's gotten to the point where his packaging uses swag as like packaging like buffering nice. so it shows up on my place and it's just more swag he comes to my place and like like takes a like a like a costco tote and just t-shirt well you know you had a plat attack hat but you snuck it into my my luggage last so time i have I so when because he sleeps in because he's a a useless member of society a, a lot Employed. So the day he's planning to leave when he visits, I, I sneak all the shit, including some extra shit, back into his uh, his uh, garbage his luggage. Yeah, empty then, cans. It, it's it's a battle to try to get rid of swag. Like we can't we can't get rid of this shit fast enough. I need a patch wall. Like apparently that that's a great way to get rid of patches. Well, that's why I have this wall. I can't that's get a great rid of way this, to get so... rid of fire uh, yeah, airsoft yeah. guns. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't you do giveaways? What, of, of shitty patches? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Just buy something. Buy my stupid review stuff when I'm done with it, and you'll get six free patches. That's Yeah, that's always been my system. Like, if I sell an optic after I'm done with it, then I'll just cram the box full of as much stupid bullshit and stickers as I can. I had a nut and fancy reviewed VZ58 that I bought. Oh, don't oh, If you still have that, I know who needs one. Oh, no, I didn't know it was reviewed by him when I bought it, but I found a card in the box that said it after I bought it. And then I was like, fuck, I should have talked him down. <laughs> <laughs> that be, oh, that, that's from the All Father. And then Jamie there, I see pipe, check piped in. He bought that VZ58 from me. So one of the oh. comments is now in possession of that gun. I have the uh, the T&P limited edition of Toronox Cadet. Can you please take that hat off? It's number it's number 367 out of 500. Not a very low number. Somebody showed up in my Discord with a much lower number of that same limited edition knife, I felt. Then you banned them. I felt, yeah, I banned them, and then I felt very inadequate, so. Yeah, I'm, I, I thought I was a big Nut and Fancy fan, but I, I failed the Soldier Boy uh, rally, and uh, I don't even have a pocket knife. You can't wear mesh hats backwards, can't yeah. No, you can't. I'm looking at your wall, Matt. I'm down to like two semi-auto pistols or some shit right now. 
So I make a really big effort of selling guns that I don't use. Like, I have like four ARs. Yeah, I still have a lot of the guns, but I've been thinning them out quite a bit. I decided land was more important to me than a lot of guns that I don't shoot. So let's talk about that. Land or selling guns? Land. And they don't make it anymore. No, they don't. Wasn't that a Lex Luthor? You have two millennials on here. We don't know. Yeah, what. We're, we don't know what it's like to own land and we never will. So yeah. enlighten us, so, please. We'll, we'll like to live vicariously through you older gentlemen for a minute. So there's this guy named Gary and he lived in a nice area with his wife, Sandy. Sandy's watching right now. So we have to say nice things. Um, they lived in this cool house. It was like a, a kind of a cabinish cool house. Beautiful views, big cool yard areas that not really yard it's wilderness ish to me and he decides to leave the luxury of having like all this like indoor plumbing and electricity and running water and all this stuff and he bought this piece of land with nothing on it is that about right there was yeah well it had a couple of old like 1970s era travel trailers on it but other okay. than that, nothing on it well, i've watched this youtube video before so he decided <laughs> to move there and like move like to live there how many people do you know always they, they talk about oh i want to go get a cabin out in the woods or i want to build by land and build this guy's done it we're going to be talking yeah. about that now because that's it sounds so appealing but then watching your posts and reading your posts and talking to you just like oh it sounds good but yeah i'm going to stay here i, I think yeah. i so I used to be on Facebook a lot and uh, I know Gary posts a lot because uh, I, I do recall that I think you said it was Heber, right? It looked a lot yeah. like Heber. Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember that phase. And then at some point I just, I got logged out of Facebook and then I forget to log back in for seven years or something. <laughs> Until so Matt I, made me come back on yes. to use Messenger. <laughs> Fuck. So well, I, I have, tried, I tried really hard not to get banned because I kind of use Facebook almost like a journal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's that's really kind of the best application of it. And, you know, people sometimes get pissed about what I say or whatever. And I don't give a fuck because I don't write it for them. I write it. I write it for me and I write it for my kids someday to read or for me yes. to go back and remember something that I was working on or, you know, whatever. I, I very much use it like a, a more modern version of a, a handwritten journal. And uh that's how I use it. And that's why I post so much is like you would write in a journal every day. I put a post on there every day about what happened or what went wrong or what went right or, you know, whatever. And it's just primarily so I can go back and remember it. Or, you know, I know that, you know, there've been occasions like my friend Jamie that's there in the chat, he comes to stay with us, you know, to watch our place or something if I'm going out of town and he can go back and figure out how to work something by looking at it, you know? Um, and, it, it works well for me in that regard. So I try really hard not to get banned, uh, <laughs> although it doesn't always work out for me. But yeah, we, what really kind of clinched it for me that I wanted to move was Heber, as we were discussing earlier, really the area that I lived went from kind of a nice, small, rural ranching community um, when I moved there in about 1999, just in the span of, you know, 20 years, it went from that to being a very sort of upscale, ritzy, very expensive, you know, place to live. And I uh, had lived in town and I lived in a very modest house that I left with my ex-wife when I decided it was time to move on. And I bought a new house up in the mountains and it was a nice place. It was a cabin and I was pretty much on, I owned one acre and I was on three acres that weren't developed. So it felt very, very secluded up in the UNOs. And it was, really was in the UNOs. I was in the, in the, you know, the quakes and everything else. You're next to the nudist um, camp? Um, no, that was, that's no. in Camas. <laughs> oh, there's another one on the way when you go up into the UNOs. I think there was, maybe it's gone. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, and that's not real, by the way. They just put that there so people will slow down. Oh, okay. They <laughs> they fooled me every time I go yeah, by. Them. Yeah, it's not real. They just it's like propagating them. because someone's like, dude, that's where the nudist camp is. And then when I bring people to the UN test, I'm like, that's where all the nude dudes are. Yeah, no, that's not real. That's the like, John, you love nude dudes, that road. right? Go check it. But we uh I started to get funny looks and we had a 
you know, like a lot of places in the West, we had a homeowners association and you kind of have to, when you live in a really super rural community like that, because the County doesn't maintain the roads, the can't, the city doesn't come in and do your water lines, you know, all those kind of things. So you have these HOAs and they actually have a legitimate function in that they're paying for infrastructure, not just yeah. trying to tell you, you know, you Ruin can't your have, day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we started to see the HOA become a lot more restrictive, which I didn't like. And we started to have things happen to me. Like, you know, I'm wearing grubby clothes or whatever, cause I'm working on a truck or I'm working on guns or I'm doing this or that. And I have a little bit of grease on me or something. And we had like a community trash can down at the base of the mountain. And I would take trash and people started filming me when I would take trash because they didn't feel like I looked like I should live there. Um, so that was kind of the writing on the wall for me. The second thing was, did you have pants on when you did that? Yeah, I did have. Okay. Pants. Just, yeah. Yeah. And there might have been a hat. He had a solid yeah. three inch inseam going. I'm not sure what their problem was. Yeah. And uh, the second thing was we started a kind of a local community movement to make Wasatch County a second amendment sanctuary County. And when we did that, I was really, really surprised at the resistance that we got from a, from a county that I had always considered very kind of pro second amendment, you know, pro constitution, pro all of those things that we kind of hold dear, but we got a ton of pushback, not just from people who lived there, but also from elected representatives. So that was also pretty telling to me as far as how far that community had gone the other direction. And the icing on the cake was the COVID supposed lockdowns. And the one escape that I have always had, one of the reasons I loved living in the West was the amount of public land that there is. You know, we all have access and use of these, you know, the public land. And I always kind of considered it mine, you know, and I think a lot of people do. And that's how come a lot of people, I think, end up not buying land. You know, you guys had talked about how you could never own land. You know, you can own land. You're just going to have to give up a lot of other things. And to most people, what that means is you're going to have to give up your RV. You're going to have to give up your four wheelers. You're going to have to give up your boat. You're going to have to give up all of those things. And in the West, in particular, I find that people don't feel like they need to own land. They're okay having their little you know, 10th of an acre lot or quarter acre lot or whatever that their house is on. And instead of buying land, they go and they buy all of these toys because we have so much public land that they have access to. And they feel like it's their land, just like I did. And they can go and use it. And these are the things that they need to go enjoy and use that land. Well, during the COVID lockdowns in my house where I was, I was literally maybe five miles from the national forest, you know, and, and it was all kind of private land and then national forest. And when I drove up there and they had pulled a road closed sign during the lockdowns and you weren't, you know, supposed to go up there and, and be in nature and be in wilderness because there was a pandemic. Was um, this Summit County? Uh, this is Wasatch County. Okay. Wasatch. Okay. Cause I know Summit went hard. Like I couldn't get to my parents for like months. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go on. But I was going to go up there and I was going to go up there and camp and, you know, use my public land and what better way to stay away from people. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, they, the government, be it federal, state, local, whatever, had basically decided that you couldn't do that. And it was at that point that I realized that's not my land. I don't own this land. Yeah. I only get to use this land because they say I can use this land. And as I pulled that, sign right out of the road and went up anyway, I had kind of decided that it was time for me to start looking for land, you know, and uh, what that meant for me, because again, like you guys say, you can't own land. Well, the trick is, at least for me, is you, you have to find a piece of land that's large enough for whatever you want to use it for. Um, and in order to be able to afford that, because I'm not a wealthy guy, I had to find land somewhere that wasn't conventionally pretty. Um, and that means not a lot of trees. 
you know, that means maybe not some, maybe not on a lake, maybe not on a creek, maybe not on a stream, maybe, you know, maybe not on a river. Um, but you can buy land still for a very reasonable price, as long as you're willing to buy land that isn't conventionally pretty. Um, and in the end, I think that that that's one of the last true measures of generational wealth is yeah. going to be land. Uh, because like you guys have said, you know, do I think that my kids who are in their twenties are going to have an opportunity to come out here and own 133 acres? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think that as things get subdivided and people can barely afford to own a 10th of an acre, you know, there's a reason for how long that people have said the American dream, it used to be land ownership and now it's, oh, I own a home. Um, on a 10th of an acre postage stamp sized lot next to all these other people who are learning with the exact be- same looking house because yep. in Utah and it's all cookie cutter <laughs> who are being conditioned to own nothing and be happy about it you know and and that's exactly what's happening so I wanted to buck that trend and actually own you know a a reasonable sized piece of land and I wanted to own it somewhere where the politics and basically the government were going to be less of a, less of an intrusion on my, on my daily life. And that was worth more to me than convenience. Um, that was worth more to me than luxuries. That was worth more to me than just about anything, you know, at that particular point in time. And I was very fortunate to have a, uh, in my wife, someone who was also very like-minded and very willing to make that leap, you know, and, and sell off something that we had that most people would think, you know, Oh, this is the ideal, you know, this is all yeah. I ever wanted in, in life. And, you know, this is what I, it's their end game, you know? And, uh, I was totally okay at the end there just saying, Nope, let's sell it to some Californian for everything he's worth. Let's take his money and let's go buy all the land we can afford and start over. Nice. Um, and, and that's what we did. Did I catch that right? So you just bought land. There's no pre-existing thing on it, right? You built right. up a, okay. Yeah. Wow. The only thing that was here was a, a lean to in like a 1970s era rat infested travel trailer. Uh, good eating. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what was here. And they tried to make those travel trailers out to be like, they were going to throw them in. And I was like, well, how about, you lower the price and all the dump haul them to the that's dump. right you know <laughs> i'll throw that away hey for man you. in the prepper community that's what's known as sustainment yeah a lot yeah. of calories in one of those things yeah so we we did it we bought initially um 91 acres is what we had um when we started and the way we actually did it and and not a lot of people know this either because a lot of people again like you said matt people talk about wanting to do this and yep. they, they don't ever get past the talking about it stage or or wanting to look at it but to to buy land that has nothing on it is very difficult if you have to finance it mm. uh, it, it is virtually impossible to get a loan on raw land you have to pay for it um you've got to pay cash because the banks have nothing. There's nothing there if you default that they can sell. If it has a house True. on it you know, or whatever, they can they can recoup their money. But raw land for them is a big gamble, and so they don't want to loan money. And so the loans to buy raw land um, for people who are interested in doing that, you better, you better come up with a way to pay cash for it because you're going to have to have 50 to 60% down payment um, for them to even consider loaning you the money. So you're going to have to have a sizable amount of money um, if you can't afford to, you know, just pay for it outright. Um, and so the the actual path that we took and, and what I've talked to several people about and recommended was, you know, a lot of people who own homes right now have a lot of equity in them. And we took out initially a, a home equity loan before we had sold the house and we got enough equity out of the house to pay cash for the land because then you don't have to get a loan. You're just taking the equity out of the house. So we took out a home equity loan and bought the land and paid cash for the land. And then I ended up putting the house up for sale and selling it and coming out with a bunch more equity even than that. Um, so it's it's very difficult to buy that raw land. Very hard. 
Makes sense. But, but worth it. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're willing to to make the sacrifices to do it. And it was it's one of those things that I was I was looking into because I was going to buy a house here um last or basically recently. And I ended up def- like pushing it down the line a bit, mostly because of just loan loan prices and stuff like that. But um, I, I was very much considering a place in the middle of nowhere as well, kind of thing. But it, oh, there's also the yeah. not literally this, middle, yeah. yeah, not in the, literally in the middle of nowhere. But a couple things kind of kind of with an issue. It's like I, it sounds dumb to call YouTube a career, but my career I think took priority in a lot of ways, right? Um, then there's the social aspect for someone of my age, right? I'm not socially established. I'm not married, you know? Uh, so that, that really becomes difficult if you live in bumfuck Egypt. Um, and then, uh, there's a lot of time aspects, right? Like, cause initially I, I've done a little bit of like homesteading and stuff and it, it takes up so much of your time. And it's like, dude, I barely have enough time to like, I don't even do fun things anymore, you know, outside of shooting, right? Obviously. <laughs> So I ended up being like, you know what, maybe maybe it makes more sense to do a house in city, despite how not preppery that is for the first house and then yeah. leverage that into as I get close to my 40s, maybe uh, then leverage that into the thing I've always wanted to do. But it, I, I thought long and hard about it because my initial instinct was like, hell yeah, brother. But it's like, dude, I didn't even like fucking taking care of vegetables in the garden like at first like it was fun but like god it was so fucking annoying like i only like the chickens the only the, I, I, that was the only acceptable thing so i was like okay you know probably not at the maturity level you know where i, I could handle something like that it's like fishing right it's like you, you gotta enjoy fishing for the sake of fishing it's like no i want to catch a damn fish so you know maybe i'm not quite there yet in life well it's different it's it's different for everybody and it's different at every kind of stage of your life i mean i couldn't have I couldn't have done what we've done without my wife. Yeah. Um, you know, to to be there to help me to do all of it, both with the physical labor stuff and with the financial stuff. I mean, she has good income, she has a good career, you know, and anybody that thinks that, you know, and they're you know, living off grid or living remotely is less expensive, they are wrong. Um, it's it's horrifically expensive. Everything costs more. Um, to do it. Everything costs more to do it. And unless you're trying to do, you know, and everybody argues about the definition of off grid, is it simply not being connected to utilities? Is it not having any modern conveniences? You know, all those things. I don't, I don't want to live primitively. Um, And I don't think for the most part that most people can do that long-term anymore. Um, I did want to live more independently uh, and I wanted to be less you know, dependent on things like city utilities or, you know, having neighbors or, you know, any of those kinds of things, but you, you, it costs a lot more. I, just, just as an example, last winter, um, we got kind of caught flat footed by winter and our house, which was under construction was supposed to be dried in. And we were going to pull our travel trailer into the shop and then we were going to work on the inside of the home all winter while we lived in our trailer inside of, you know, in, inside of this insulated building. Uh, well, we got as far as having the red iron up with no siding. And then we had the worst winter in 50 years hit Wyoming. And so you guys too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty rough and we were living in a, in a travel trailer and just the sheer amount of time and money that it cost me to keep us alive through that winter was staggering. Um, I was using about, you know, to power generators just to keep heat and keep water liquid in the trailer. I was spending about $30 a day in gasoline. And if you remember last year, the gas prices during the winter were astronomical you know they were pushing five bucks a gallon um if if not more and so i was spending 30 35 dollars a day in fuel cost just to keep the thing running and keep the water liquid and keep the heat on um and so the the cost of it is is a lot more than you think it is and it's something that people really should consider whether they're 
financially able to do something like that, aside from being able to actually buy the land, just take into consideration that every single thing you do is going to cost more power. You know, okay, I'm going to do solar. Well, to get a good feasible working solar system, my, my solar system here installed is about $40,000. Um, and now I don't have a power bill, but all I did was prepay my power bill for the next 25 years. Yeah. You know, I paid for it up front. That's, that's what we did. And a lot of people will not have the resources to do that. And you can do it on a, a smaller scale, certainly than I did, but you know, I, I would consider the system that we have a minimal, you know, a, a subsistence system. I certainly don't have like a surplus of power that I don't have to think about it. You know, every day I'm, monitoring my power usage and how much battery I have, whether I need to run the generator or not, you know, all those little considerations that people may not think about, you know, um, but it is not less expensive. Um, and some people, I, I constantly see people talk when they talk about it and they read posts, they think that it's cost effective and it's not, it's probably the most expensive thing you could do outside of firearms and aviation. <laughs> So that's something else to think about. So for you, what was the biggest difference between the expectation and reality? Um, I, well, it, it, it depends. That's a, that's a two part thing for me right now, because last winter and, and living in the trailer was a totally different experience from what we have right now. Last winter. And let's, and I, it, I lived in that trailer on this property for about a year and a half because we lived in it while we were in the process of selling our home and showing our home and, you know, all of that. Um, which I'm amazed that the red queen stayed with me that whole time. Cause she even said that. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's a saint. That's for sure. Living in that thing with me that time. Um, especially a woman who's a woman and likes to be a woman. Um, and therefore needs a bathroom, um, you know, a, a nice bathroom, <laughs> but in the, in the, when we were living in the trailer, it was really just a subsistence existence, you know, and, and it was for me a, a pretty much a full-time job just to keep us from either freezing to death or running out of water or getting rid of water once it was dirty. Um, and then you throw livestock into that mix because we ended up getting some sheep and, you know, we had chickens and we have the dogs and, you know, all of those kinds of things. I mean, I, I literally had so little time. People are always like, I messaged you, didn't you see it? And I'm like, I, I, I literally have zero available time. I'm spending all of my time keeping getting water because we were hauling a hundred percent of our water. We had no well on site that was functional. We we're hauling all of our water, keeping that water liquid in sub-zero temperatures and available for use, keeping the pipes in the trailer from freezing. When that water's dirty either in the toilet or the shower, having a way to get rid of it. You know, I was, I was literally spending a hundred percent of my waking hours, just trying to keep everything running to the point that we could survive here in that trailer. And that brings up the point that you and I talked about earlier, Matt, the people who have a trailer or have an RV and are yeah. expecting to use it as kind of a, a, a bug out plan um, or a system. I would, highly recommend you re-examine that um, because it is probably not feasible for very long term. Um, those things are not, even mine was supposed to be a four season trailer. And as soon as we started getting freezing temperatures below 32 degrees, I had problems with pipes freezing. I had problems with nothing working, you know, all of those kind. this is a four season trailer, you know, it's insul double insulated, you know, all of those kind of things. And we ended up having to, um, go and get hay and straw and stack it all around the base of the trailer. Um, I got some of that kind of bubble wrap reflective tape um, and insulation. And I put that up just everywhere where you could feel airflow. And those things like you could feel cold air coming in every seam of that trailer, every single seam, just literally a cold jet right above your head as you're sleeping, it's coming in. We had, I spent a lot of time winterizing that trailer and trying to get it, you know, usable. And we still were freezing up, you know, a few days a month. And then that brings on a whole nother set of problems trying to defrost 
and mm. get that thing back up and running and you know the fuel and and the time it takes to do those kind of things so if you if you have a trailer or an rv and it's a primary plan for you to use in the event of an emergency um i, I would strongly advise that you examine your water issues because the water issues in that thing was my main issue and the heat. Um, I had to repair the fan forced propane heater in my trailer four times last winter. Um, it broke. It literally had parts break four times last winter. So I had to learn about trailer heaters. I had to learn about propane fan forced heat. I had to get the parts and the parts aren't always just readily available. Um, I got to the point where I still to this day have spare parts for every part in that trailer heater that can break and I can fix them now in sub-zero conditions too. Um, so if you, if that's part of your plan, water is a huge one. Insulation is another one and being able to feed that thing propane, um, having the capacity because propane, I was using a 30 pound propane cylinder about every three days. Um, and you have roughly two of them on the average trailer. So you have at best about a week's worth of propane fan forced heat inside of a, a travel trailer or an RV as part of a bug out. And you were there for a year and a half. I was there for a year and a half. And that was winter. And in summer, that drops yeah. you know, dramatically. We actually ended up getting a 250 pound propane tank brought out on site before winter because I was using so much and we put that there. And I think that lasted me until January. <laughs> so I still ended up hauling a bunch of propane, but those are all things definitely that you would want to consider if you have a travel trailer or an RV and you're wanting to use it as a bug out plan. They're not, even if it says four seasons on it, it's not. It's like the sleeping bag rating, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Survival versus comfort. And even yeah. comfort is full of shit. It's like, this is comfortable. <laughs> this thing has been tested in the harshest environment Southern California has to offer, and we guarantee it will keep you alive for four seasons. In Southern California. <laughs> in your home. We meant yeah. four seasons as a measurement of time, not four different seasons, <laughs> like it will last four summers. No, four seasons, the hotel. Yeah. Parking yeah. in the parking lot of a four seasons, and it will last all year won't even hardly fall apart on you. Well, and if people are interested in that, you can go look at my Facebook too, because I was posting pictures of it about every storm with yeah. six feet of snow stacked around that trailer. And another bad issue with those is condensation on the inside. Yeah. Uh, you just get wet and it freezes. We literally had ice on the inside of the trailer on all the walls. You could put your hand on the wall and it was just a sheet of ice pretty much all winter. Oh, it's that scene from Apollo 13. Yeah. Yeah, it was rough. I get excited about both. I'm sorry. And then you get mold on top of that, which is not great for you. Yeah. Or the shining, my or wife. The shining. Yeah. yeah. She got pretty close to that a couple of times. Did so. you find red rum on a mirror once or twice? Yeah. Yeah. She, uh, if she had, if we had enough water that she could put steam on the mirror, then she probably would have, but we didn't have that much water. Yeah. So speaking of water, you started with, bringing it in and now you're well yeah so when we when we first bought the property here there was no well on the property and that's no well. definitely for people to consider is can you get a well permit um is oh. it likely that you will find water on your property um we had a pretty good idea that we could find water on the property somewhere because a lot of our neighbors had wells and i had you can actually look on like on the wyoming um state website there's a I, I think i can't remember whether it's geology or whatever whoever does the well permits but they have you can go in and look and see your neighbors that have wells and how deep they are um to give you some idea of how deep you're going to have to drill you know in that area to find water um, and then of course can you get a well permit because you can't everywhere um, we were able to get a well permit relatively inexpensive and we had a pretty good idea that we could find water and then also take into consideration you are going to have to hire somebody to come and drill out well and it took about six or eight months once i initially contacted our driller 
for him to have the time to actually come out um, and, and look at it. And he literally, I thought he was looking for golden plates, Matt. He put divining rods in his hands no and he way. walked around the property a little bit and they were moving around and he said, this is the place. Um, and Dan, if he didn't hit, I would ask for my fucking money back. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he drilled every well around every one of my neighbors had used this guy and he found water for him. So I was like, I'm All not right. going to argue with results. This guy knows you're, this. you're on one giant water table. Then. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. yeah. <laughs> Anywhere. He found it. If that uh, guy worked to work anywhere else in the country, his success rate put him in be Utah. Zero. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> Less yeah. desert. He did good. He hit it. Yeah. He hit water the first hole, uh, 360 feet. We had to drill, and they charge you by the foot. Mm. Um, and if they don't find water, you, and you have to drill another hole, then guess what? You're paying for that too. Um, so Ooh, that must have been nerve wracking with the divining rods. Then <laughs> every day was was rough watching them drill and the first three days when they were getting down to that 360 feet and we hadn't hit any water yet and i'm looking at fifteen thousand dollars on a hole that's got no water on it um it was it was pretty nerve-wracking needless Do to they say, look to you to make that call they're like hey we're down to 300 feet nothing yet should we keep going or should we cut yeah, our losses well, and that, you say that, let's go another 50 feet you end up 10 feet shy of the water you're like shit now we got to drill a new hole and, and he kept asking me, you know, what do you want to do? And I was like, look, I'm, his name was Lloyd. I was like, Lloyd, I'm paying you for your experience. I'm not paying you to drill this hole. I'm paying you because of the other 150 holes you've drilled here. That's why I'm paying you. If uh, you don't find water, you put the divining rod guy in the hole. In the hole. <laughs> That's right. Find a new one and start over. Hey, there's well, lava coming up in this hole. Is it, do we go too deep? Well, the other thing I, if I know my Minecraft, you're not too deep oil. until you hit bedrock. Exactly. If you hit oil, you're fucked because then your water's no good. Oh, but then you're rich. Yeah, yay. Oh, but then the U.S. mill. <laughs> you well, don't yeah, but then, have the mineral rights. But then you, you get to experience shocking off but... firsthand. So yeah. it's what, probably not good. What's the effect of a javelin missile on your homestead? <laughs> like, yeah. We're not a javelin, a, a cruise missile. So they, uh, we were fortunate that he found the water. But before we had the well, we had a community well the um the property owners association out here paid to drill a well and it's a good usable well and everybody that owns property here has access to it you have to take your own generator over to it. it's about two miles from my house and so before we had the well i would go to this community well and we took a, one of those 275 gallon ibc totes you can go on like ksl and, and classifieds and buy them for 75 bucks you know good clean used ones um, and I'd put that into a trailer and I'd fill it up with water and I'd haul it back. And then I had set up a solar powered battery operated DC, uh, water system so that I could pump the water. And that was all like inexpensive Harbor freight shit. That was all pretty, you know, affordable, but you did have to have a generator, like a 3000 watt, you know, starting load generator to be able to power the well. The problem with that was, um, around, I think it was around November. One of the other owners went and used the well and didn't close the frost free, you know, hydrant. And so that left water pressurized in the, in the system that didn't drain back down and the well was frozen for the rest of the winter. So we had no more access and no more water. Damn it, Carl. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that can screw you, right? I mean, the carelessness of somebody else cost me a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money last winter and it was probably just somebody who didn't know any better but that doesn't matter it the, the the net effect on me was the same and uh so then we had to go to an alternate source and fortunately my neighbor that's about a mile away had piped a spring a uh, literally a spring that's on the mormon pioneer pony express trail it's been there since then and it probably watered a lot of mormon pioneers in its day but he piped it and I, he allowed me to use it. So I had to haul that IBC tote on a tract side by side in, you know, six and eight foot drifts and haul it. And the most water I could haul at a time at that point was about 75 gallons, um, just because of the weight limit and the fact that I'd get stuck if yeah. I hauled any, you know, any heavier water. So I was usually about twice a week having to go get water and we were on kind of survival rations 
for our water. I was, I called it hyper miling. Have you seen those guys who like try to squeeze every mile per gallon out of their car with the chips and they coast and put it in neutral and they, you know, just, they, they do all this crazy shit to save gas. Well, that was me with water last winter. Uh, was it a still suit? Is that what you were wearing? A still suit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hop and brass got it. That Dune reference. Yeah, no, I have never seen yeah, I have read the book. I don't know if I'd recommend it to anybody. It's very dry. Uh, uh, all right, it's, ladies and gentlemen, that's good a night, everybody. Uh, this episode is sponsored by yeah, by Dad. Wait, my entire life to tell that joke I stole from somebody else. Nice, Nova. What do you want? So what water. Want? Yeah. So we we made it through, but we I. I will never again um, take water for granted, and yeah. it's such an it's such an important thing, and you don't realize it. And I think a lot of people don't give it the credit that it deserves in terms of a preparedness plan or, you know, planning in general for those kinds of things. Because you can go through water really, really quickly if you're not if you're not very, very careful. Yeah. Um, and we were having to ration showers, um, you know. I was, I was showering maybe once a week because Sandy, I felt like Sandy would not have the quality of life that she needed to stay in the trailer with me if she wasn't. So I was doing it less so that she could do it more regularly. Um, the other thing is it's a lot harder for, uh, females, women to go to the bathroom outside, you know, than it is for us. And so I was, every time I had to piss, I'd go outside and I'd piss outside. And that was whether it was snow and sideways or sub zero or whatever. And that was to save room in the tank and use less water uh, so that she could use more, you know, yeah. so that she could have a better quality of life. But even those, those kinds of things in the water that you use for sanitation, you know, we, uh, I was taking, here's another one that, that I underestimated the importance of, and that I found was probably the most crucial tool that I had to help me ration water was dish pans um What's using dish, pan? dish pans in the sink will help you save a ton of water rather than just running water and letting it go down the drain and what we would do is i would even use like we'd have two we'd have a wash and a rinse for doing dishes and i would wash it and rinse it and then eventually when that wash water became too dirty to yeah. use it like i would dump it outside not into the, the trailer water system because that meant I had to then keep that, thaw that, haul it, and dump it. So it got dumped outside, and then I would take the rinse water and put soap in it, and then that became the soap water, and I would use a little more water for the rinse water. But then when we were done, the rinse water stayed there for hand washing um, you know, during the course of the day. And then when that got a little bit dirty, I'd use it for toilet flushing. You know, you can pour and the way that those toilets work. My grandfather used to just keep a five gallon bucket in the bathroom and he would take bath water and he would use that to flush his yep. toilet just by pouring it in. And so, you know, we were having to do things like that. Um, but dish pans, if you don't have a set of dish pans and there's a potential, you know, for any prepper that you need to conserve water, save water, I highly recommend getting a set of plastic dish pans to help you, you know, do those kinds of things and, and conserve water and use it. Once it's dirty, use it for something else that the dirty water doesn't matter for. But it's even like, just little things like that made a huge difference. It's a pretty hardcore flashback to the Boy Scouts. You know, we're in the middle of nowhere, but we still are making stupidly complex meals. So you got the three three buckets of water, right? You got the the initial shitty thing and then you got to go to the clean one with soap and then you got the rinse one and then my mom was kind of poor so she's like really hardcore about like you know when you run the shower and it's cold for a second you put that in the bucket so you can flush the toilet it's like why are you flushing the toilet use the, the shower water to flush the toilet my Thanks. dad has Thanks, always mom. been just like a hardcore conservationist to the point where it doesn't even make like a ton of sense you know where we don't live in an area where water is scarce at all but it's just the, the way he was. So like when he, my dad takes a shower, he will wet himself with the shower. Then he'll soap up. He'll turn the water off, soap up, then rinse off, turn the water off. I mean, like his showers use like six cups of water. You know, it's ridiculous. It's like, come on, dad, you're, you're old enough. Now, hopefully he has gotten to the point in his life where he's like, you know what? I think I'll take the entire shower. 
You've earned it. You've earned yeah, it. Yeah, people people call that a navy shower or a or a trailer shower, and that's that was standard. That was the only way that you know we could do it. Um, and you wanted to do it that way because eventually you have to get rid of that water too. And you know, there's a sanitation aspect of it. We were initially because we had no septic. Initially, I had a, a transport tank to haul sewage water, right? Um, we would just dump the gray water because it was just soapy water. You know, I could just dump it on the ground, but obviously the black water, the, the sewage, you don't want to do that. So initially, it, believe it or not, in Evanston, there's like two RV dumps and they all close for the winter. Um, one is a state park and the other one's an RV park and neither of them are operational in the winter. So we had basically no way to get rid of that. And that was something that kind of snuck up on me that I was not prepared for. I thought that I would have a way to haul that out, yeah. you know, and get rid of it. Um, so what we ended up having to do is I picked a location that's about half a mile from where we planned on building our house and everything. And I dug a pit and I had to haul that over there and dump it in the pit. And I was doing that once or twice a week. Uh, all went well for a year and a half, essentially. Um, and let me tell you what, when that black tank freezes and you essentially end up with a poo sickle, about 40 gallon poo sickle, um, and wow. the tank is full. Well, that's going in my vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. right. and, and, you, uh, and you can't use your bathroom anymore because you can't get that poo sickle out. So you're out there with a propane fired torpedo heater, um, turning it into from a poo sickle into poo pudding, because you can imagine what that smells like when you heat it up. The dictionary um, is getting a bunch of new definitions tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then dumping it into a tank, hauling it a half a mile away, and then having the lovely experience of watching it pour into a hole in the ground that you dug. Um, Brock, they didn't teach you this phase change science when you were in college, did they? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 right next to the, the the triple inflection point steady state. It's right above. That's the poosicle. The secret hidden fifth state of matter. The poosicle. Yep. yep. Yeah, it was rough. Well, I'll tell you that I finally filled that hole in this fall, and it was probably the happiest day of my life outside of my kids being born or meeting my wife. Um, it was a really you know, you, you really learn not to take the ability to flush a toilet for granted. And now I can do that. And my life is a hell of a lot better. What a relief. That, yeah. That I literally don't twice to do that anymore. Um, but that's definitely something to think about again, if you've got an RV or even just if you're trying to plan bugging in at your house, you are going to have problems getting rid of your sewage. And you better have a way to haul it. And you better have a way to get rid of it. And most people don't have that. And there are, you know, ours is, I think, a 25-gallon uh, transport tank. They make them for RV parks and stuff, so you don't have to move your RV. You can just dump into this tank and then haul the tank and then dump it into the, into the septic. But uh, that was another piece of gear that I had already had, and I had bought that because we were camping long-term up in the Uinas, and I didn't want to have to move the trailer to dump the, you know, the tank. So I had already had that piece of equipment. So I was fortunate that I kind of already had some idea what to do. Um, but that was very, tri that was my number one least favorite weekly task, you know, for, for about a year was doing that. And you better think about those kinds of things. If you're going to live off grid or if you, have an RV that you're planning to use for bug out purposes or emergencies. And then even just at your house, your toilet's not going to work. And guess what? Your toilet's probably going to back up and come things you don't want to come out of it are going to come out of it. Oops. Uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. You don't want sludge sickles. And worse than the poop sickle is the poo pudding. That is horrible. It's horrific. Yeah. I'm just waiting to hear about poo plasma when you accidentally heat it up too high. <laughs> That's right. The poop, well, the poop criticality where it's both the gas solid <laughs> the poop and goes the poop goes super critical. One of my one of my neighbors says that I have and Sandy does too. They they say that I have winter PTSD, and I think that some degree I do because I still wake up at night with this recurring nightmare that I have fallen into this pit. Uh, <laughs> poop. Uh, I probably will never disorder. 
Did you yeah, go to I college would... by chance? What's that? Do, do you have a college degree? No, I have some college, but I didn't finish. I ended okay. up going into guns. So I wonder, yeah, if like I'm I'm waiting for something in my life to be bad enough that it supplants the college nightmares. Actually, uh conventions and travel has started to do that. So I used to have all these like nightmares about college years after I graduated. But now that I have a job where I travel more, I have nightmares about navigating hotels and airports. So fuck yeah. But better than better than yeah, falling into the pit of of poo plasma. Like that's a, that sounds pretty bad. Yeah, my, my my PTSD is just, you know, showing up to take a math test in a class, a sem- like a class that I have never taken. Like I've I've never been to this class all semester and now we're taking an exam. I've graduated college for a while now and it's, it's when you guys be better than the poosicles. If and when you guys come out here, I'll show you the location. It's just a nice flat spot on the ground now, but <laughs> I have a lot of trauma in that spot. <laughs> dense trauma, yeah. <laughs> so talking about the water, specifically the well water, is that stuff that you're drinking or is there something separate that you're drinking? No, we drink it now, or we can drink it now. We still drink a lot of bottled water, okay. um, but... The, the, the water quality is also something that you just don't know until you get the hole drilled, right? Um, and one of the big problems is the water comes out like for a month. You know, mine was longer than a month. It comes out just as almost just a sedimenty yeah. mud, you know, from drill water. Drilling. So you really don't know what kind of water you have for quite some time. Um, and once you start to get it cleared up and we have a lot of sandstone around here and anywhere where you have sandstone and you have water going through sandstone down into the aquifer, it gets a sulfur smell to it. Mm, yeah. You know, a rotten egg kind of a yep. smell. Yep. And that can lessen or worsen, you know, depending on the time of year and, you know, egg the water, you know, all of that. And ours does have a fairly strong kind of a sulfur smell mm-hmm. depending on, you know, the time of day right now, at first it was really sulfury and really bad all the time, but now it seems like first thing in the morning, I can smell it. And then as you, like, if I do the dishes or we run a load of laundry or we take a hot shower or whatever, then it really kind of dissipates and it's gone for the day. Um, but you, you just don't know what quality of water you're going to get. Now, my neighbor, that's a mile and a half, two miles away, he's got beautiful water it smells great it's almost sweet tasting you know whatever um ours is, that's is, lead man that's lead water <laughs> did you see what jamie just said lead what's that oh jamie in the chat water table can change as well my water uh, or my well started without a sulfur smell but have had a sulfur intrusion yeah it interesting can. different times of year it can the conditions underground can change and you know ours is technically an artesian well 360 feet down and crafted too. Yeah. So what we did, and this is also something that's interesting is we have a filter that I filter system that I decided to go with was the Berkey, um, the big Berkey system and the Berkey black filters, which were some of the, you know, catch all filters. Basically you could filter standing pond water in this thing and drink it. Mm. Um, and there's been some controversy with that. And now apparently the government, the FDA has shut Berkey down for making virus claims that it, that it filters viruses. And they're saying that it has to be classified as a pesticide and all sorts of stuff, but they've essentially shut Berkey down and they're closing. And we saw that Sandy and I saw a post about that just a couple of days ago. And that's the water filtration system that we use when we drink it um, or when we use it for culinary stuff. And it is, it's amazing. It comes out of that and it's the best quality water you could get, you know, um, it's a really great system. So I was really kind of disappointed to see that they were having some FDA problems and getting shut down. It seems like, a, you know, like a lot of things that are related to independence and self-reliance and yeah. you know, all those things are, are really getting a crackdown from the government. And that's one of them. That's just one of the latest victims. So we're kind of looking for a a replacement place to get filters for that. And we do have three stage filtration on the house, but it's not to the same degree. You know, just for example, it, the I still have the sulfur smell in the morning when it comes through my three stage filtration in the house and that's sediment, charcoal, um, and carbon, um, right? And 
it still has that sulfur smell when it comes out of the sink after it's gone through that system. But when I put it through the Berkey, it has zero smell mm. and it has zero taste. So clearly that, you know, system is still something. Yeah. The, that, and I know, um, you mentioned lip might show up. I know lip uses that system too. Cause he and I have talked about it and he says that he's filtered pool water with it and drank it and it was great. Oh, wow. So that's, uh, that's just another little interesting side note, but we do filter it an additional stage. If we're going to use it for culinary purposes, we don't have to, I did have it tested. Um, we sent it off to, I think it was actually university of Utah by you and in, in, in Logan. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they did a water test full, you know, virus and bacteria test. And it's a hundred percent biologically safe. It just don't smell great. Yeah. Interesting. So but water has definitely been one of my biggest challenges. Well, and the the fact that you mentioned several times your water and keeping it liquid. Yeah. Like, huh, I guess that kind of makes sense. You kind of need to do that. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you're, if you're on a well, you do that by digging below frost line. Yeah. Ours here is eight feet. So my water lines are all at eight feet deep. And then anywhere where you have traffic over the top of it, you also have to put foam um, like styrofoam over the top of the water lines before you backfill because it, when you drive on it or walk on it, it can actually push the frost line down and freeze your water lines. Um, but when we were hauling it and storing it in those IBC containers, um, I started out trying to use just like a stock tank heater for livestock, but the least efficient thing that you can do with electricity is turn it into heat. Um, and I didn't, we have no power. And so I was running electric heat to keep water liquid on generator power, which means I'm paying for gasoline Yeah, you know, to do it. And it, that's partly why I was spending so much money on, on gasoline running the generators. Um, but I initially, I bought a small one, 150 watt stock tank heater, which was not enough to keep 275 gallons liquid. It started to freeze. So I bought another that was uh, 500 watts. So I had about 650 watts in there and that would keep it liquid until it started dropping sub zero and then it started to freeze. Um, So then I had to research a little bit and I found an insulated cover that a company in Colorado makes specifically for those IBC tanks to help keep them liquid in the winter. So the combination of basically 650 watts of stock tank heat and an insulated cover was enough to keep that. And I wasn't running the stock tank heaters full time. I would only run them when I was running the generator, which would be probably about four to six hours a day that I was running generator to keep trailer batteries maintained from running the propane heat in the trailer and trying to keep that water liquid. And then when it dropped down sub zero, I also had two small um, space heaters electric space heaters underneath the trailer inside the skirt yeah. that I would, I would run under there to keep the pipes from freezing. So literally six hours a day running gas, $30 a day, trying to just keep the water flowing. Cause if you can't keep the water flowing, you can't stay there. Yeah. You, you have to leave if you, if you don't have water, not just for you, but for your you know livestock, I was keep in mind, I was watering livestock too. You know, I don't remember Sandy, if she can chime in how many sheep we had, it was like 15 of them or something. Um, and they drink all year, yeah. whether it's winter or not. And that's mandatory also in Wyoming that you're supposed to have sheep. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I drink all year as well. Yeah. Oh, we're, oh, we're talking about H2. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you ever find a, a point where you wound up using snow as a source of water? No, I, I did do that but i did it to prove a point and i did it because in your um preparedness and survival yep. forum which i was posting in pretty regularly oh, to yeah Insta, it's awesome um a bunch of people had kept mentioning and even on my page they kept saying well why don't you just melt snow the heat and I think or that, energy right yeah yeah exactly you know and the amount of water that is in snow is actually very small you know, by volume, it takes a lot of snow to produce a little bit of liquid water. 
And I wanted to kind of prove that point to people. So midwinter last winter, I went out and started filling big, you know, stock pots with snow. And I would take the time that it took me for, to turn the snow into water and how much water it produced versus how much propane mm. I was using to do it. And if you remember, that turned out to be like one of the Nothing. least efficient things that you can do. It's also worth considering that like, at least scientifically water has one of the highest in the world, like material wise, specific heats or specific heat capacities um, in existence. Water holds more heat per unit density than anything else. And that's why we use it for certain things. And it's why the ocean doesn't fluctuate in heat so much. Um, water holds heat very well. And that's ice as well. So you need to expend exponentially more heat per water than like any other, you know, material out there. Yeah. And, and, and it's like so the old bushcraft think. thing of like, oh, if it's raining and you need to get warm and dry, just build a fire. You're like, oh yeah, I'll just build a fire in the rain. Easy. Try, yeah. Try building the fire in the rain, try melting the snow. And then you realize it's actually, it's not, it's not going to keep you alive. If you were, if you are able to do it, you're probably doing well enough that you don't need it. Well, it ended up being a lot more efficient from both a time management standpoint, because you only have so many hours a day, mm. to get everything done that you need to do to keep yourself alive and keep everything on it. Um, you just simply don't have time to melt snow. And you certainly don't have the propane to melt snow when you're also using that propane as your only source of heat, you know, to keep you, to keep you alive. And that propane goes really fast, really, really fast when you're, when you're running heat full time, you know, we, we would set the thermostat in the trailer at 65 and it would never, well, it didn't matter how high you set it. It never got above 65. Mm -hmm. um, and for a redhead, you know, my poor little wife, who's very, very sensitive to temperature fluctuation and does not like being cold in the slightest, you know, that's a, that's a big deal. And it was very difficult to keep things warm enough to be comfortable. Um, in fact, I don't remember that we were ever really comfortable. It was always just, we can tolerate it, but it wasn't ever comfortable. And the only other thing you could do would be either to put in a wood stove, which um, now that we've gone through that, I consider it a high likelihood because there are companies that specifically make very small wood stoves for like camper vans, RVs, you know, things like that. I, I believe that that is going to be something that I do to that trailer is put a small mm -hmm. wood stove in it. Um, Interesting. Cause I really wish that I had that last winter. And by the time I figured out I needed it, it was too late to do it just from a, you know, we had feet of snow. Uh, it was pretty much impossible to do anything outside. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's uh, the water thing. I can't, I can't stress enough. You got to cover that base and you got to cover it three ways. Power. Yep. Power. Um, no power out here whatsoever. Um, the closest power lines from the power utility companies are about a mile and a half, two miles away. Um, the last person out here who got a quote to run a power line that far, it was about 400 grand, um, Jeez. To run, to run utilities, you know, to the, to the properties out here. And in doing so, you also have to obtain an easement. And that's something else to consider when you're looking at property or off grid property that you want to live on is your neighbors are going to have to consent to have that power line run across their shit to get to yours. Um, we have somebody out here who wants to do that and none of the neighbors will give consent and good on them. Cause I don't want them to do, you know, to, to do it either, but, uh, it's really completely impractical to get grid power to our location. Um, I don't really know that I would want it, even if I could get it, I kind of like the independence that mm. I have being off of it. And with it comes a lot of stipulations as far as how you what kind of solar system you have and how it has to be operated. You know, it has to have a shutoff switch so you don't backfeed the line if the power goes out or, you know, whatever. But uh, we initially started out in the trailer. I, I did inherit one of the things that was here hooked up to one of those 1970s trailers was a set of Harbor Freight solar panels. Oh. 
um, and a charge controller and a set of um, Harbor Freight batteries. And believe it or not, that actually worked okay, like for keeping their batteries charged. And I just said, well, it's here already. I'll just use it too. And so initially I had hooked it up to my, my trailer and, you know, you have all those little parasitic draw things that you don't think about even on a trailer or your house load. And in the trailer, the biggest parasitic draw at night was the heater blower motor. The fan that blows the heat uses a ton of power. And during the day, it's just the refrigerator, you know, keeping that refrigerator on and running, even though it's propane and it's running on propane, it still uses some electricity. And over the course of a day, that's enough to run the average sized RV trailer, you know, trailer house battery down to the point where it's bad. And depending on what people know about power and batteries, um, lead acid batteries, which is what most RVs have on them, I think still, you know, just regular car batteries, they really are not supposed to be discharged below 50%, which would read on a meter for a 12 volt battery at 12 volts. That's a 50%, you know, discharge on the battery. When they're charged, they will not freeze. So if you keep them charged, it doesn't matter how cold it is. The battery's mm. not going to freeze if they're charged. But if you get it down below 12 volts and it gets below freezing, the electrolyte in there will freeze and it will expand and it will ruin your battery. Interesting. I went, I went through two sets of trailer house batteries to the tune of about four or $500 last winter. And it was simply by running them down over the course of the evening, trying to keep the trailer warm, running that blower motor, and then it was too cold and I didn't have a way to charge them back up because I was asleep and they froze um, and they were ruined. It wouldn't hold a charge anymore, you know, and they would just discharge very, very quickly. Wouldn't take a charge. Yeah. And uh, so I found out very quickly that I needed some way to trickle charge those batteries during the day so that every evening I had a full charge going into the night to be able to get through the night. And then even then I found out, which you could talk about in a minute, but I found out I even had to get supplemental um, power and battery coverage in the form of what a lot of people call solar generators now, which are really just a battery bank with a, a charge controller and, a, and an inverter in them. Um, I use the Blue Eddy brand ones, but I found that I could extend and get that trailer house battery to run the heat all night by running everything else that we were running on these you know, supplemental batteries because it's extremely cost prohibitive to, to put a large battery bank in. It's very expensive. Batteries are crazy expensive. And I ended up adding, because I already had the infrastructure for those Harbor Freight solar panels, and this is not what I recommend people do, because I didn't know enough about it at the time and I was still learning about solar. Um, I just expanded that system. I went to Harbor Freight and bought a few more sets of panels because it would easily integrate into the system that was already there. And I ended up running to maintain during the day, if I had good sun, I had 300 watts of solar panels through a charge controller hooked up to my batteries, which were two six volt batteries in series for 12, um, at about 400 or yeah, 400 amp hours. That was enough to keep them charged up to the point in the evening that I could run the heat all night. And then in the morning, first thing I would get up and I would start a generator and run the generator for a couple hours to build those back up. But that was walking a razor's edge as far as yeah. the charge goes. Cause if I, if I, a little variance, yeah. If I overshot it just a little, the batteries would freeze and they did. I lost four or $500 in batteries, you know, you know, doing it that way and having to replace them. So power, you know, in the, in the trailer and in, in managing that power, you never have as much as you think you have with those solar systems. And if, if there's one thing that's taught me that, um, mantra that I told you about earlier, that there's theory and there's practice yeah. and the two seldom come together. Um, the thing that really illustrated that point, the best for me was solar power. What I thought I would get as far as output how long I thought it would take to charge it. And this is based on, you know, the technical specifications of the panels and the amp hours of the batteries and the voltage of the system and what my draw was and, you know, all of that. 
you might think you have enough, but until you actually do it, you never really know <laughs> if you if you have enough. Um, and I, I finally got that to some kind of a stasis where between the solar panels and the generator four to six hours a day, I had enough power to do what I needed to do. But the big plus for that and the, the blessing of the year and a half we spent in that trailer really was the power situation because that really prepared me and set me up to do the right things when I built the house and put the solar system in the house. I knew a lot better what I needed. And now we've got what I think it's, it's still a minimalist system. I'm not over paneled. I'm not over batteried. I have what I need, but it's working very, very well. And of all the things that we've done out here, I'm the happiest with my, mm. with my solar power. It and didn't you have a, wasn't there a rodent issue? Oh, rodents. I mean, like with the power, yeah, that how it affected the power. Eating well, up. the rodents chew everything. So yeah. Out here, and I think anytime you're living off grid or anywhere, rodents are going to be a fact of life and you better have a way to deal with them. And I had made a couple of posts about that while it was happening. Um, we would set, and Sandy got to be really, really good at this. We didn't want to do poison because we had the dogs and we didn't want our dogs to eat poisoned, you know, rodents, po poison so you, mice. You gave the dogs 22s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she she tried to shoot a couple. She did actually, I think, shoot a couple of mice. One through a dog bowl once. That was pretty awesome. But uh, we ended up buying some traps, um, and it was a trap recommended to it by a friend of ours on Facebook who's an exterminator. And we bought, I think, a twenty four pack of these rodent traps, rat X trap or something. I can't. Sandy might know, um, but we would set traps every night. And every morning when we got up, every one of those traps would be full with a mouse. Uh, and they will absolutely get into everything. They were in the walls of this trailer. They were in the ceiling of this trailer. You'd hear them running around, making burrows in the insulation, um, gnawing on the wiring, um, not just from a, you know, a, a sanitation standpoint, but they will literally chew into your wires and cause you potential fire problems and, you know, everything else and and the rodents and having a way to deal with them because they will absolutely destroy if you have food storage and it's not in a rodent proof container they will destroy your food store they'll get in your cabinets they will chew your boxes they will chew your packaging they will shit on everything um and you have to have and be mindful of a way to control rodents and that even holds true still now even in the house even now that we're in a better situation we have mice. We are always going to have mice. And it's a daily struggle just to keep them in check because of where we live. If you, you know, I, I use thermal out here a lot um, for predator control and just to check things out and see. If you go outside of my house at three in the morning with a thermal and look out in that field, it is alive with rodents. I mean, just little glowing dots everywhere. It's unbelievable the amount of rodents that are here. And if you don't have a plan to deal with them and the way to deal with them, that's why I said in that post in the preparedness group, buy a case of this shit now. Buy a case of these traps. They're very inexpensive. You can store them. They don't go bad. Bait them with peanut butter and have a way to at least keep these things in check. You're not going to eliminate them. You're just going to have to learn to live with it. So that was definitely another Another big one was learning to deal with the rodents. So I'm, I'm thinking. I got a cat. Do you want him? Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing with the cat. I am like deathly allergic. Oh, I'm to allergic cat. to cats too, but I'm not allergic to this cat. He is, he's the magic cat. Something about him. I don't know what it is. Maybe because he's an outside cat. I'm not totally sure. But uh, his deal. So he won't kill the mice. Uh, he will cripple them brutalize them and then they're not fun anymore so he just lets them go uh so you still gonna you're gonna have to do some of the work yourself you know you're gonna have to put the mice out of their misery but he'll leave a bunch of quadriplegic mice on your doorstep for you that's nice of him and then well, that just snacks. yeah I and mean, that helps you do the tally because then at least you can figure out how many mice there actually are because if he's just out there eating mice you'll never know if he's doing his job or not this way 
you know for damn sure it's accountability he's having an effect exactly he's he's trying to make sure that the you know the spreadsheet stays up to date well and if you want to open a can of worms in a conversation online talk about a mouse trap because everyone that that saying holds true the better mouse trap everyone has a better mouse trap everyone has a trap that they think works better than whatever you have um the bucket trap was one that people kept bringing up with me I, I simply don't have the room in a 23 foot RV to put a bucket and have a little spinner thing covered in peanut butter for these mice to fall into. Um, you know, you, you have to be realistic about your size constraints and where you can put them, you know, you can't put a bucket trap in your wall. Um, you know, we, we literally, I was pulling panels off the wall of this RV and putting traps in the walls so that we could catch them. Um, but boy, if you want to, if you want to start an argument online, talk about religion, politics, or mousetraps, because hmm. uh, that'll that'll definitely do Polarizing. it. Polarizing. Yeah. And and the other thing with the cat as a consideration is, is I, I want to get barn cats now, but I have two German shepherds, um, and they can be a little problematic with, with cats. And we have coyotes. And Sandy would not forgive me if I fed cats to the coyotes. Well, that's why you have the thermal to kill the coyotes before they get there. Yeah, I do sleep sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I'm, I'm thinking these guys are hearing about this and they're just thinking road trip. Yep. Well, it's a fun place. The range is coming along. I got a little more work done on the range this spring, but cool. Still not quite where I want it to be. But uh, Jamie, who's there in the comments, got, put me out of target early this spring. And I think we shoot out to 850 now. Um, and everything in between. And then I did just acquire, we started out with 91 acres and I got another 42 acres. So That's we're right. up to 133 and I had to sell, um, a bunch of guns to do that. But I had about, we still had about $50,000 in cash equity money from the sale of our house that I was kind of sitting on for, you know, emergencies or whatever. And then that property came up for sale. And again, it's virtually impossible to get a loan, you know, to buy raw land. And then I didn't want to deal with a loan. So I ended up selling about $30,000 worth of guns in about a 24 hour period. You probably saw me oh, yeah. being pretty sneaky about it on, oh, yeah. on my Facebook page. Books but, and magazines and yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we, uh, we were able to pull that off and come up with the cash to buy that additional property. So now I've got 133 total acres, which we'll use for, you know, grazing and livestock and shooting. You know, the, the whole reason we initially bought the property was that great backstop. <laughs> Heck yeah. So we do have that. So we've, we've spoken, we've talked about water, power, sanitation, access and roads. Yep. Um, you better make sure that you can get to it. Um, and that can be in a couple of ways. Does one, does it have roads? Can you get to it via road at all? Is the road maintained by a government entity or is it maintained by a property owners association or is it's it? HOA. Yeah. Um, ours, we have 22 miles. They made me the president of the HOA. Uh, cause I said, I wanted to get rid of all the rules and just pretty much take care of the roads. We have 22 miles of association maintained roads that we pay for, um, in our dues and, and, and do that ourselves. So we do have that. But the other thing is, is if you have to cross someone else's property to get to your property, do you have a legal easement? Um, cause not every property does. There are properties out here around us that don't have a legal easement through railroad properties. There's a road that goes through them, but they don't technically have a legal right to cross that railroad property to get to their property. Um, which could, you know, down the road present a very, very big problem. So it's definitely something you need to consider. And then lastly is the, you know, winter situation. Is it yeah. somewhere where you're going to need winter maintenance? And here our roads were completely impassable this time last year to where I was a hundred percent coming in and out of the property on tracked vehicle. I have a Kubota side-by-side -side, and I bought a track system that replaces the tires um, and it does pretty good, but I still got it stuck four or five times. Um, and that was uh, really difficult to get out. And that brings up another one, communications. 
I'd have been fucked several times without ham radio and without GMRS radio. That's become a staple out here amongst our little community and our full-time neighbors. Mm -hmm. I actually set up a, a GMRS radio network. We have an emergency frequency that everybody has programmed into their radio. And it's when anyone's traveling on the roads, we monitor that frequency and we all check in on each other um, all winter because the roads here are so treacherous. Um, our roads are old railroad grade. And so you have 30, 40 foot drop-offs on either side in spots Jeez. and it can be really treacherous and hazardous to drive on. And we've had whiteout conditions where I just literally had to stop and sit there for 20 or 30 minutes until the conditions got better so that I could even see to, to continue driving. Um, I've driven by GPS where I am holding my phone and just trying to stay on the track because I can't see. Um, and there is no county maintenance in the winter whatsoever. They put up big signs that say, go back now, abandon yeah. hope, all you who enter, you know. Um, they just actually put those signs out. So if you're looking at off-grid properties, you better make sure you have e easement access. You better make sure there's some kind of maintenance on the road that you're not solely responsible for. And you better make sure in the winter, if there's not maintenance by the county or your association, that you have a way to deal with that in and out. And that could be snowmobile, you know, tracks, snowcat, you know, whatever. If you're in an area where winter is a thing, which it definitely is here. So what you're saying is if you live in Wyoming, you need to get a special rating on your driver's license that's instrument rated. Yeah. So you yeah, can just... definitely. I would put out some beacons. I put out some beacons yeah. if I can. But I definitely um, highly stress the importance of communications and networking with your neighbors, because there have been times that my neighbors have broken down and I've had to go help them. In fact, I just pulled a neighbor out. I think Monday, um, went I went and got him out. And there's been times where I've had to call for help and literally have my neighbors come and get me out with a snowcat or bring a snowcat in to drive my road down to the point where I can get my tracks in and out on it and networking and having a way to communicate because we do not have reliable cellular telephone signal here. Hmm. Uh, I have it right here at the location where the house is, but if you drop down onto my range, you have zero cell signal. And so that kind of just, even just as simple as all my neighbors went and bought GMRS radios and GMRS licenses and I made them a little index card with, you listen to this frequency, this is you, this is me, this is the emergency channel. And having that in place has paid big dividends in terms of safety. Because, you know, if I'm not here and Sandy's driving in and out, my neighbors are checking on her. They call, they text, they call on the radio. You know, we, we have a really good network of people who are out here. Because everybody out here understands it can kill you. Yeah. You, know, the, you can you can die doing this. It's not a it's not a safe thing to do by any stretch. And it's expensive. And it's expensive and a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, out of a 24 hour day, you get two hours of sleep. What's the rest of the day consist of? Typically, if you're not working, it's it's all if I'm not working, I have about a four hour window um, right now, and that's this is not speaking with the trailer with the trailer. I had zero time. I was yeah. always doing something. It was literally dusk to dawn or dusk to yeah, dawn to dusk. I was working and crashing into bed and getting up and doing the same thing. Um, here now that we've got the house and I don't have quite the water chore burden that I did, but now I do have more animal chores, um, get up, feed the animals. Now our house is, we do have propane forced air heat, um, but it is, it uses so much electricity to run it that it's not practical for me to use it being on solar and on batteries full time. I can, if I need to, and we do have a backup generator that I can run it on if we need to, but then I'm using propane for the generator and propane for the heat. We use wood heat primarily. Um, we have a really nice wood stove and it heats our, roughly 2000 square feet of living space pretty well, but it's a lot of work. Um, keeping wood dry, getting wood in the first place 
keeping it dry, splitting it, keeping that fire going, feeding it, you know, throughout the day. Um, and I've learned a ton about, it really makes a difference as far as how you load the load density, the way you stack the wood inside the stove, you know, all those things come into play, but it literally probably takes me an hour, you know, in the morning to get the wood stove loaded, to get it packed and to get it going to the point where the house is going to warm up, you know, start to warm up for the day. And then you've got animal feeding, which takes another hour and a half, two hours, depending on whether I have to do water or not. Cause now I do have water out there. I can turn on the, the hydrant, but I still got to run the hose over and fill up all the places where I have water out for the livestock. And in some cases break up the ice and dump it out and, you know, put new water in it. And then you've got breakfast and dishes from last night and sweeping up the hair from three dogs and, you know, all those kinds of things to where I get done with my chores. And then I always, this is another thing, like you've got to be able to work remotely if you still have a job or if you still have a career um, to be able to do this. And the only reason we're able to do it is because of Starlink. Um, If we didn't have Starlink internet, Sandy wouldn't be able to do her job and she'd be staring down a three or four hour a day commute. Um, I wouldn't be able to do my job. You know, it would be just completely impossible to, to live the way that we're living right now without Starlink. I, Uh, I really suspect just based on the feed right now that your internet now is better than it was in Heber. Oh, it's way better than it was in Heber. Yeah. That's insane. Definitely better than mine. Oregon's still on that. Like, I I don't know. Heber internet was pretty bad. (laughs) Well, I had, in Heber, I had HughesNet satellite, and it was god awful. Yeah. That was the worst. Inter- <laughs> I played video games with friends in the shitty part of Park City. Like, I, I get that. Yeah, it. The Starlink is great. Um, uses 150 watts, unless the heater's going on it, and then it uses about 300. I can tell you pretty much what the power draw is on everything in this house that runs. Mm. Um, and. That's another thing that you just kind of learn and you learn to live with it. You know, you figure out what you can use and when you can use it. Um, but you have to have a way to, to work. You know, you have to be able to, to do that career. We're both fortunate that we have jobs where we can both work remotely. I do have to travel some. Um, she works 100%, you know, from home. But uh, then you've got your your daily you know, answering emails, answering phone calls, answering questions, setting up travel, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, on a day off, when I'm not doing those work related responsibilities, I have about a four hour window during the day where I don't have a task accounted for. So I can pick what I want to do every, all the rest of the time I'm doing the things that I have to do every day to keep things running. Um, just chores. Right. But there is about a four hour window now where I can like, for example, organize the shop, do a little gun. Like I've been, it sounds stupid, but I've been super excited because I know that I'm going to have time tomorrow to put a scope on this PTR 91. And I haven't, I've been trying to do it for three weeks and I just haven't had the time. I couldn't justify the expenditure of time to put an optic on this thing and then go down to the range and zero it, you know, and get it ready. Uh, and I will have time to do that tomorrow. I mm-hmm. hope <laughs> it's looking like I will. Um, but the amount of time that it takes and still being able to do your job, you know, your the way you make money, your career, uh, it's tough. It doesn't leave. Let's just say you won't see me playing video games. Um, I don't, I don't have any time at all for those kinds of luxury things. It's, it's, it's more work than you can possibly imagine. Um, but it's also rewarding. You know, I know people who pay for a gym membership and go to the gym for a couple hours a day and I don't have to do that anymore. And I'm losing weight and (laughs) getting strong. And, you know, I mean, just your lifestyle is your gym you know, when you're doing it. Sounds like you should become a Twitch streamer so you can save a lot of time by combining your video gaming with your employment. There you yeah. go. <laughs> or you can become a gun tuber. So then your range time is your employment. Either way, you can definitely compress your day by doubling up on some of your activities. Yeah. Highly recommend it. 
Well, and you know, I have people keep asking if I would make YouTube videos or whatever. And just the, I do make, you know, I do do some media stuff for my company. I do videos on body armor and, you know, shoot related stuff, but even just the amount of time it takes to produce the content, edit the content, upload the content, you know, all of that. And, and I'm just like, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to do a YouTube channel on this homesteading thing, but I, the people who have time to do that, they, I don't see from my experience how they can possibly actually be homesteading if they're doing vlogging on it. They are doing, I mean, I'm they're wearing editing GoPro. right now in another window. Like I've got, I'm editing as we speak just to save time. Well, I don't know if you could do that and shovel horse shit like I do for an hour every morning. <laughs> there's also, there's a, a meme that I really like, which is like behind every homesteading woman is a husband earning six figures in IT. That's right. And it could go either way. You know, it's, it's the, the genders are not important. The, the fact of the matter is if you have time to be a full-time homesteading influencer, someone's still got a job out there and it's not the influencing part. Yeah. And we both Pretty have. It sure looks cool. And we both have full-time jobs. Um, and you know, when Sandy's not working, she's working on everything else. I mean, she's the, unfortunately the vast majority of the home finish construction stuff is falling on her. Cause I, I spend so much of my time just keeping everything going. You know, if tile needs to be done, unfortunately it's going to be Sandy who, who does it. Um, just because my time on all the other things are so, so progress on any projects that you have outside of your normal everyday chores is agonizingly slow. Um, you just never have the time. Like I, if you guys come up, you'll see it. I've got, I used to reload a lot. I used to do a lot of hand loading, almost all the ammunition I shot, I hand loaded and my hand loading stuff has sat idle over there with the expense exception of a little Lee hand press that I load 50 rounds at a time on or whatever. I've got four workbenches over there covered in reloading tools that in two years I haven't had time to use or set up. It's just, there's an inch of dust on all of it. And I'd like nothing better than to, you know, go over there and cast a bunch of bullets and load a bunch of ammo and, and do all of that. And, uh, I it just, it's simply, I, I don't have time for it, yeah. let alone the shooting and even shooting, you know, shooting is different now for me too, because I have a range here. I can shoot whenever I want. Um, and I find that, I do go down there and I shoot pretty regularly, but it's not like I used to shoot. I used to load up five or 10 guns or whatever. And I'd go to the range and I'd go all day. I'd shoot all day. And then I'd come home and I'd do whatever, clean brass, clean guns, wipe them off, whatever, you know, but now I go down and I shoot 25 rounds or, you know, 50 rounds. And then I call it a day and I come back up because I can go shoot whenever I want. And actually, I think that's actually made me a better shooter because I shoot more regularly, although the quantity that I shoot is greatly reduced. But I don't feel like my my skill set has suffered because I think the regularity is more important than the quantity. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it is for me. Um, you know, and that's that's been interesting to see. And also, I have slayed a lot of personal sacred cows as far as firearms go um with this experience because i'm a i'm a ak guy i love the ak platform but when i pull out a rifle and i need to hit a coyote sized target at 500 yards and i need to hit it right now that's probably not the best tool you know for that for that job so it's a double it's a double barrel shotgun yeah so yep. I got this uh, this airsoft AK, and uh, as you can tell, it's it's missing most of the AK. It's just not a good platform, dude. <laughs> well, it's missing parts. Well, I think actually the gun was uh, just a gas tube. And yeah, just your, no, I mean like bolt? it's actually better now that it's missing parts. Like at least now I don't have to shoot it because I can't shoot it, so I don't have to waste my time and money and and incur you know unrecoverable hearing damage from torching off an AK uh, two chamber Midwest break next to my head. So it's actually doing me a lot of favors. Yep. Well, there's a lot more ARs riding around with me these days than there has been for a very, very long time. But also single action revolvers. Lots of single action revolvers. That's more of a nostalgia thing for me. Um, cool though. 
and it's and it's a totally practical tool for the application. You know, I don't I don't feel like I need more gun than that where I, where I'm at. And I've gone away from carrying a lot of different guns, and I pocket carry a detective special now that I that's right wouldn't have dreamed of. You yeah. know five years ago. Um, well, I remember the uh, Phantom was one of your favorites. Yeah, I still have that. And if I go, if I go anywhere bigger than Evanston, I typically take that Phantom, but I even change the way I carry that too. I carry that in a shoulder rig now instead of appendix. Um, so, you know, I've, I've changed a lot of my, my gun habits, the types of guns I'm using, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I had to, really re-examine critically what I was doing yeah. and what I should be doing based on the change in my circumstances. And it's really been kind of eye-opening. And yeah, you know, I had to sell off a bunch of guns to fund this property deal, but it was also kind of an excuse for me to revisit, you know, what I use, what I actually use, yeah. what's what's useful to me here. What's a, what's am I ever going to have a good application for this gun now? and move off some of that stuff. And it's also going to give me an opportunity to rebuild, you know, and, and bring in some new guns that are going to be more practical for uses that I've got really got a hard on for a 243 right now, just like a target set up 243 for coyotes. Yeah. Kind of want a, a longer range, you know, even my, you know, SPR AR setups aren't, they don't have enough legs for some of the coyotes that we're seeing. So they'll either get the 300 wind mag or I can build a 243 and I've kind of wanted to build a 243. <laughs> so that's changed a lot. All of my gun stuff's changed a lot. And interesting. A, a 7.62 by 39 AK is not a very practical tool out here. A 5.45 gun with an optic is still, you know, pretty practical, but it's, uh, you need, you need legs out here and, and AK doesn't always fit that bill when we're talking about, you know, canine size targets, which hurts me to say. Yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> now, where you guys live, that might be a different story. Well, they don't have any Surprisingly, animals. Morgan. No, it's not. It doesn't. It turns out the environment matters very little. It's just your level of investment in, in the practicality of the system. If you ever are actually confronted by the realities of like, oh shit, I actually need a gun that does the job, then you're going to grow out of the AK platform real fucking fast. Well, I don't know about that. I think that it still has a lot of real world practical applications inside its operational envelope, um, which is inside 300 yards. Um, and and geez, friends. if I had to take a, if I had to take a, 200 yard shot with an AK, I would take it into the roof of my own fucking mouth <laughs> rather than actually try to take that shot. You need I mean, to you gotta some... be fucking kidding me with that, dude. You got to get some better AKs. Yeah. So I went through uh, the AK builder class with uh, Jim Fuller and this was like in 2016, I think, or 17. And the rifle that I got that I, that I assembled and all that and used the press, um, after it was all completed, we went to the range to make sure that they functioned and yeah, okay. I can hit the target. Okay. Now I'm going to, I'm going to aim for stuff way out above the, above the range out on the mountainside. And I was able to hit what I was looking at. I don't know what the distances were. They were considerably further than whatever the range was uh, providing, but it was. That's pretty compelling because you can't make hits at distance with the AR platform. It's not possible. No, you can't. So and I'm, this I'm, also glad, a, I'm glad that you had the right tool yes. for the job and there. It, it also is a 5.45. Oh, okay. So, so I mean, sure. 10 and years ago. And it's of gray. Course. So it's that much better. Battle, like Battleship right. Gray. Hop, Hop is moderately bitter about how that AK video went. <sighs> well, what kind of AK is it? Ooh. I've got a, a, a PSA, PSA. KTF 5. That's not an AK, that's a PSA. Well, <laughs> oh, it's, we got go. a, it's got an FN. It actually has a good barrel in it because it's made but by FN. It? Oh, because FN, everything they make is good. Well, <laughs> everything they actually make is good, not everything they sell. They, they sell some stuff that isn't made by them, and it's uh, it's 
become quite I've a scandal. Actually, I've actually put the FN barrels in some guns, and they are decent. They're decent shooting barrels. Um, but PSA, not just in AKs, but in AR-15s, of course, as well, has a history of hit and miss. Um, and PSA was often works, which then became DDI, and then PSA bought out DDI and didn't bring Troy Sellers, who was the guy at DDI, who fucking knew everything, and then they bumblefucked they basically the entire gun um and i have a collection of of psa horror stories that are they're not even stuff i found on the internet it's stuff that i actually experienced you know in within my group of guys who go out and shoot together of their historical inability to assemble an ar correctly well you know, i still, I I still like the company and say... i like a lot of the stuff they make but like assembling an ar is something i can do in 20 minutes on my lap with a you know with a towel and a, and a wrench assembling an ak requires machinery a press. so the fact cheap, that the fact that they waiver. have <laughs> they still have a hard time assembling the ar platform which almost anybody yeah. can do with no tools does yeah. not inspire confidence in their ability to assemble an ak which require i mean yeah, if you assemble the AR say. wrong, you're like, whoops, and then you untorque it and torque it back yep. properly. Yep. Yep. If you what assemble I, an AK wrong, you got to melt it down and make a new one. PSA AKs in a nutshell is PSA has the potential to make a decent AK. They do it with alarming infrequency. That's that they they have the potential, they just don't. Um and you know, really if you want to get a good AK really the still the best inexpensive now if it's an expensive option is the romanian wasser 10 um i would take that over any psa ak or any century built not century imported but century built you know ak and i'd frankly even take it over a kusa gun um they're just not they're still the the u.s domestic kalashnikov manufacturers are not as good as any of the former satellite states. You know, they're just, they're not, or even a kit built. The best option is still a Russian or Polish or Bulgarian or Egyptian or, you know, whatever, a good quality parts kit put together by somebody who knows how to do it and cares about doing it yeah. and doing it correctly. But then, you know, what, what do you end up with? You end up with, you have to be realistic. If it's a 762 by 39 gun, you're you're inside 300 yards. I mean, really. It, Here, here's a question for someone that really is into AKs, right? If we discard the nostalgia and the cool factor, and by God, I love this nostalgia and cool factor a lot more than hot. literally love, not one human. I love being doing do speedy reloca uh, reloads with AK. There's like passion there. With an AR, it's like using my fucking piece of shit Milwaukee tool, right? But if we discard that component, like what what is what is in terms of utility, practicality, and more, what it, what is the AK platform bringing to the table, or is it a or or do you kind of view it as a uh, a mill serp with you know usability to it? I guess versus what like an AR fifteen? Yeah, versus like an AR versus um, a real gun. He means right. I mean, this okay. I want to I want to you know add on to the fact that there there is a certain aspect of you know everything gets the job done and they're all within like twenty percentile of of you know optimal and sometimes it's, it's or okay with an AK it's maybe like sixty percent of you know a hundred percentile but you know. And it's okay to have a little bit of passion in there, right? That's what guns are for. We love doing this. But if we view it on an objective standpoint, like for someone that's really into AKs, how how do you, you know, how do you think it compares on that that metric? If objectively the platform is worth worse and the cartridge is worse, and these days the platform is also more expensive. Now, to, you know, roll the clock back fifteen years, and you're like, yeah, man, the average person cannot afford to spend twelve hundred dollars. 2006 money on a Colt AR to get a good reliable rifle because they are so more of course, expensive, right? Of course, they're going to buy the $350 Wasser expensive. 10. That doesn't apply anymore unless you know you you bought the guns back then, 15 years ago, and just never made another cent in your life. Maybe you're on fixed income. I don't know what the fuck your problem is. You're stuck with the AK you've already got. Fine, dude. Fine. I'm not gonna I'm gonna shit on you for that. I'm just saying that right now you're like I have the option of paying six hundred dollars for a reliable, accurate, modular, ergonomic, lightweight AR that shoots a, a good cartridge that is affordable and available, or I can overpay for some boutique throwback AK bullshit, which is has shoots a worse cartridge that's becoming more expensive, less available, shootability, modularity, excessive, you know, all this stuff. 
it's a just a garbage platform, right? Surely well, we can agree on that, if nothing else. Oh, this Here's is what I would say to you. Yeah. Are you a are you a man that has a toolbox? Sure, but what I don't have a I don't have a fucking hydraulic. I don't have the the hydraulic press that you got, so I can't no, be I, just no, I, I, I mean, can't be pushing rivets into the comfort in your, of my own home yet. What's in the toolbox that's in your garage right now? Do you have a hammer in it? Sure. Do you have a screwdriver in it? Oh yeah. You ever tried to drive a nail with a screwdriver? Well, that was that's getting to the question I was asking. What is this speciality that the AK hits? What's a snitch? That, yeah. The AK. I mean, if we're gonna be doing this, what's the appeal of of nails? Screws are the superior fastener. Why are we still fucking around with nails? This is antique well, technology you, you can make in a blacksmith shop in the in the dark ages. Except a screw. Oh man, a screw. PSA the holding power can't. of a screw. Except PSA can't right. Even with an FN barrel. Or, Right, but like, the gun. but how about like the perfect Jim Bowler AK? What is, what is that? What's the wrong with this gun? Can build the gun, as you guys all like to say. Come over here and build one. I have this. Is, this is over the thing there that I'm so can, I'm so can, uncertain I about. I donate because so I have a you're, right you're now. I have a PSA K, which is reliable, accurate, and seems to be well built. And people are like, no, that's not a good AK. You got to get a washer. For seems to be well built. Yeah. Do you have as in ages? Did you check as in? It's not mis. It's not malfunctioning. It's gone through fifteen hundred rounds so far with no malfunctions. We're going to keep shooting it, see what happens to it. It's accurate. Uh, it accepts furniture. Nothing's out of spec. The front side isn't canted. The rivets aren't all fucking weird shaped. Like this is all very. It regional. accepts. First, it accepts aftermarket accessories. I put a can of piston in it. What is fine. your metric for acceptable rivets? Do you know what a good rivet looks like? It clearly doesn't seem to matter you know that it, much. You know yeah, what import, it because does. my complaint of this platform has nothing to do with how well PSA can build one. It's a hundred percent in the fact that putting a flashlight on this fucking rifle made me want to fucking kill myself. Right, right, gets and that's not the, PSA's fault. Uh, that's Mikhail uh, uh, Kalashnikov's fault. But, but and the, back when he was still alive, I, 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 he's got it. It didn't matter because flashlights were useless anyway. So why would you even put one on a rifle? What a waste of fucking time that was. So if I'm like, man, this platform fucking sucks because attaching a flashlight and a sling to it is like an exercise, a kindergarten exercise in patience. And you're like, ah, but that's just because PSA can't make a good AK. No, that's not no. even what we're fucking talking about. No, that's we're talking you, about that's the because platform. You have a hard time with it because you have a hard time putting a flashlight on it because you don't know what accessories are available. You don't know what other people have done with it. You don't, you're not into the market for the AK. You're not into the subculture for the AK like you are the AR-15. Uh, it, yeah, it is a subculture. It's it a, sure is. It's a it's a boxed loyalist enclave of uh, of hipster faggots who really sorry bad word uh, hipsters who want to uh, to uh, now identify themselves. It's almost that, a shibboleth of like I know you're a cool guy because you've got an AK. There, that was that's the new AK culture. And do you know where the new AK culture came from? It came from guys who were bored with AR-15s and came into the AK and turned their hipster faggot culture from the AR market into the AKs, which is my biggest problem with the AK culture right now. That's a, that's a really bad sign to me, is the reason you wanted this gun was because you got bored of a better gun. Yeah, yeah. That immediately, I'm like, whoa, hey, yeah. you just you just gave away the whole, you know, you just gave away the whole charade well, a, right this there. This is a callback. This is a callback to what Gary was talking about marketing. And you have the flat-brimmed... Yeah, no, that's exactly yeah. what it is. And, yeah. and the AK culture has a hundred percent AK culture has become that. Yeah. And it's from the influx. It's not the AK culture that I knew 10 years ago. It's the AK culture that came into it because they already had their little Instagram post with their AR-15 and they quit getting likes on it because everybody else already has that same AR-15. And if you don't have this flashlight mount, you're gay. And if you don't have dimples on your fucking dust cover, mm -hmm. then you're fucking stupid. And if you don't have a yeah, I know what you're duck on to. your fucking shit, oh, then well, you're now not it's cool. now it's not even you're subtle not, anymore. You're not gonna win the flex. <laughs> it was subtle then it wasn't subtle. You know, now do Hodge. No. <laughs> you're admit, you're can can we win. answer the question though about what the what the so let's pretend the AK, like you can do all these things, but what what is the niche that it occupies? Because it's clearly I like neat. that we have to pretend you can do all those things because in reality you actually can't. So right, ignore Hop for a second. He's, he's the, he clicked over at beer four. But like what so like 
I, I, I don't mind, you know, paying a little bit of penalty for some some soul and shit like that, right? It, as long as it's within 20%, I don't give a fuck. I can still make hits. I can do whatever. But pretending for a second that that doesn't exist, what is the the quantifiable objectable niche objectable objective niche that the AK occupies over really just all other platforms that that makes it justified to spend because it used to be like it the opportunity cost wasn't there but now the opportunity cost is brutal right it, it's it's tough to get no, into it, an AK. and it's changed. it's like radios right it's like now it's, it's like you need to be autistic about it so what what is driving me to get into it beyond like this gun is cool. Right. That, that, that's what I want to. Right now, you'd have to be a fucking idiot to get into it right now. Um, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Right. Like, I don't hate AKs because they're bad. I hate AKs because, like, I, I can't recommend this to a normal human being that doesn't have meth, like methamphetamine levels of addiction to the gun industry and wants to, you know, just enjoy themselves. Right. That's cool. Right? Well, here's, here's the thing, though, is mm -hmm. why do you say that you have to hate it? Um, I don't hate AR-15. Well, I'm not hot. So, and I so, like, yeah, when I like AKs. Yeah. Uh, I don't hate anything. People just refuse I, to uh, no, you hate I feel like, understand my, my point. I feel like I'm a guy that has a toolbox. Mm -hmm. right? And I like to pick the right tool for the right job. Right. And even as I've stated personally, I'm finding that a tool that I really, really like yeah. is not necessarily the right tool for the right job. And it makes me sad, but I'm still taking the right tool for the right job right that if i can intervene here what is the job for the ak like that's killing what i'm trying things. to get at killing things right but so but is the it. air 15 uh, killing things right you find that with like coyotes um you, you find like at a certain range the air 15 becomes the hammer for the nail i'm asking right. like what 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 is the what is the the scenario where you find I'm not coming for, I'm not going for an, uh, an AR-15. I'm going for the AK. What is that scenario? That's, that's ultimately what I'm driving for. What is the scenario where it's like, Hey, policy prescription, buddy, an AK is for you. I'm, I'm trying to ask that question. The situation there, and it depends greatly on the rifle. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. because we I can am, pretend it's a good rifle. I, How about that? Let's I, I'm a hundred percent totally fine with the AR-15, as long as it's yeah. a good AR-15, because there's a lot of really shitty oh, AR-15. Absolutely, absolutely. And in, here's the scenario. If you said to me, Gary, you can take this PSA, AK, you don't get to QC it at all, you don't get to take it apart, you don't get to look at it, you don't get to do any of that shit. It's $600, or a Smith & Wesson M&P 15. Mm -hmm. You can take this, or you can take this Bulgarian AK. And you're going to have to bet your life on it. I will take that Bulgarian AK. Sure. 100% of the time. Because I know that a shitty AR-15 is not going to be as reliable from a function standpoint as that AK is. Now, a good AR-15 is a different story. You take, for me, my particular crack brand of AR-15 or whatever is Sons of Liberty Gunworks. Mm-hmm. I've gone to, I went to Armor, Will Larson's, one of his last Armor's courses with, with Matt. You know, I will, a good, a, a very high quality AR-15 will run with any AK that's out there. Right. It will. But it takes a very good one to do that. Right. And but when you are looking at a staggering number of shit that people do to them, go to any gun store and stand at counter and watch what fucking dog shit AR-15s people bring in. You're looking at it from, I am a, an aficionado. I have the money to buy a nice rifle, you know, whatever. I'll put it this way. I will take an SKS. I'll take a fucking Chinese Type 56 SKS off the shelf at Sportsman's Warehouse here in Utah before I take that PSA gun or that m and right. I have uh, long said that the SKS is the finest battle. Oh, shut the fuck devised. up. I know exactly what you're referencing. <laughs> fuck up. Um, right, right. But I, I think the, the issue nowadays in the current paradigm is that the Suns cost 1500 at most or less usually, yep. and the AK costs upwards of 2000 for a yep. stock rifle. And that's well, because, as you guys put it, the hipster faggots moved from the Air 15 platform. I'm right. saying that word. It's I only said that on accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 
they, they Landfair runs a clean show, man. Platform, Come on, be nice. And they moved into the AK because it had the cool factor and cool boy. Right. Now it's look at my. Also, Russia man. may have invaded a couple countries and and imposed sanctions on themselves. Um, well, yeah, and I mean, there's always scarcity. You know, you have scarcity, and so and like I said, you'd have to be an idiot to be okay. jumping into. And I've said before, you've seen me say it, Matt. You have to check the box first. What's most appropriate? If you live in the United States and you do not have a high quality AR-15 that you can bet your life on, you're a fucking idiot to move yep. into the AK platform. Um, you you check that AR-15 box first. Mm -hmm. And then you move on into the AK. And if you do it, you know, different things that it does for you. Um, for me, my application, my primary application these days for an AK is in an SBR configuration. And mm -hmm. it's a front seat gun for me in the trunk, in the truck of my car. And it, I can fold it and it fires folded. Um, I will not take a 762 by 39 AK any day over a 545 gun. 545 is pretty much the only thing that if I was doing any kind of serious work with an AK that I would, would take, um, right. 762 by 39, um, you know, and yet people will argue the relevancy of 300 blackout in an AR-15 <laughs> when you've got 762 by 39 in the AK and they're sixes, you know, ballistic equivalents, yet everybody gets all worked up about how awesome 300 blackout is. Um, and you can even buy subsonic factory seven, six, two by 39 and run it. I mean, it's not as great. Of well, a you can fucking try <laughs> right. good luck finding that so-called subsonic X 39. Good luck. Well, I made, I've been making it for 15 years or 20 years. So, but that's, I, I load most of my own ammo anyway. Um, and it works really, really well. And it works just as good as any subsonic 300 blackout ever did it, it doesn't shoot as well because the platform's not as inherently accurate as the yes the you're suppressing an ak is a, is a little bit more involved but you can do it for sure i've done it yeah i do know something about that yeah it's it's a, it's a little i mean but i mean you'd, you'd admit it, it takes one or two more Look, steps no offense but i'm gonna put a resonator k on this airsoft ak that i got here and apologies to uh to the to the dead air legacy but uh yeah no i'm not i'm not buying an ak can i'm just using the shit i already got yep but it's oh. it's it, what it boils down to is like i said i'm not a guy who has just a leatherman tool mm -hmm. i have specialty tools and for me like i mean honestly the most applicable ak that i have today is either a post sample auto 545 gun which is just a riot um the rpk the rpk is a fucking death machine even in by 39 that thing's awesome but that's again that's an auto you know platform and i have it um but 11 and a half inch the 100 series ak's the crank you know something really really short something folded something is almost a pdw roll that's where i see the real value in an ak for me today it's not so much you know I'm the first to admit these days there's an AR in my truck more than there is an AK because I need legs, not reliability. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get killed if it doesn't work. I'm just going to not kill what I want to kill. So you know, and that it, it's. So your, your big thing is, it seems to be like as a, as a car gun with folded and then cold is a big one that I've noticed with AR 15s as well. Like just lube just fucking hates the cold. And then as soon as you get snow on it, the snow melts and all the lube go fucks off to Egypt right so that seems to be the big yeah big thing and, for you. I mean, if, I, if i may like push you towards a there, there is a there is a reliability issue there but for me i've i've always said that a a good ar-15 will run lockstep with an ak you, you, okay. it's, so it's not, the folding aspect then to you, you can well, over gas any gun you want yeah and you can you under gas can. an ak yeah and you can definitely under gas an ar-15 yeah and that, people, that seems to be the new the new hip thing to do. Like, a lot of those, yeah, come from the factory under gas because they just whoops wrong wrong drill bit size. So, fuck it. Yep. All right. So, so I'm I'm just trying to kind of feel even like because I know you're kind of, you or at least you were kind of an AK guy. It's like oh, I when, still when, am. When, when do you grab the AK when the 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 the, the mission set says hey 
this calls for an AK. And it seems the answer to be is like, you like it for the PDW, like folding stock, crank, short barreled nature of the AK. But most other things seem to be calling for, you know, an AR-15, right? To, to use the toolbox analogy, yeah. right? Because the, the thing with the toolbox is you don't reach in there and it's like, God, I feel like using a hammer today, right? Which like we do with the gun industry, but really yeah. it's more like, oh God, I need the hammer a nail today. So you grab the hammer, right? So yeah, I'm asking it, it, what job that is for the AK. Sorry, I, I don't mean to be- No, hyper- that's it. But you it, can hammer a screw. It just takes dedication. God, you're killing me, huh? <laughs> and, the, and the role that I used the AK a lot more in was the urban environment. Okay. Um, you know, in, in an urban environment where I'm not having those five, 600 yard shots, you know, yeah. shots that I need to make or whatever. And that's where that PDW role really comes in for me too. With the three nine uh five four uh with the crank, right? More so than the yeah. three nine. Yeah. Or I guess they're both three nine, but seven sixty three nine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the I definitely I'm a five four five guy. I'm not a Okay, guy. so five four five. Okay. Yep. Yep. Five four five guns are are where it's at. So that's really kind of the role for me, and that's where the role always was preferred. But then, you know, there is a cool Milser kind of a factor to it too, but that's not oh. a practical you for know, sure it's not a it's not a practical usage thing but you know if you looked at my air 15s too there's no there's no that what'd you say hipster faggot bullshit stop saying that jesus uh, <laughs> where it's good we're not this is not the errands of grievance because uh, that was live this is at least you know d- oh no this is still oh gonna go God. and they're yeah but it, put put no. beeping noises over it but make oh, it no. so the beeping noise where it doesn't do anything effective no. you can clearly say he's saying that just mistime the beep deliberately so yeah. it's like a second late whoops yeah let's just say my ar-15s have never ordered an ipa People... so one thing that i have experienced with ak's on and a uh what's the word hey, institutional friend. level is they were definitely easier to teach versus mm-hmm. ars when people didn't care, okay, you put in the magazine, you rack it, safety, that's all. Whereas... That's kind of how I, I, I taught AR-15s a lot. I don't teach the bolt catch boat release until like three to four lessons in because it confuses the manual of arms because it's a conditional like if and statement. Yeah. It's like, just run the charging handle. Hey, I showed you how to use a handgun. You rack the hand... Like people understand handguns or shotguns, right? Mentally, they, they understand pump the fucking bitch when it's time to go. And with an AR-15, I'm like, run the charging handle. But the charging handle is super weird because obviously it's weird. We understand why it's weird because you don't actually use the charging handle ever. But with an AK, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm I'm with you with that. That's another thing I got I got some heat for. As all of a sudden, I'm into AKs now, apparently. But you are doctrinally, a that- Yeah, exactly. I am now the, it's not, again, that's such an inappropriate word. I don't even know who would say that kind of thing. Obviously, not I'm me. saying hipster. Yeah, gross, dude. Gross. We drink the general Ninkasi beer, not the not the hipster Ninkasi beer, the beer that everybody likes. Anyway, uh, getting into AKs and stuff. A thing I caught flag for. This is doctrinally speaking, I follow very much the Pat McNamara approach, which is safety on all the fucking time. Yeah. So I put the safety on before I reload. And I do that on, as much as I possibly can. AKs don't really work that way. So there's a bunch of clips of this, this AK video that I made, and there will be in more AK videos coming on where I put the safety on an AK before I reload. So I'm just taking a magazine in, and then I have to put the safety back off, yeah. rack the charging handle, and then put the safety back on until I'm actually on target so I can take the safety off to take another shot. And that's the way that I think it probably should be done. It's the way that I do it. Uh, it's the, it's what I think makes the most sense, especially if you, if you have any aspirations of I'm going to be working in a team environment. And I think that's exactly what Pat McNamara is always talking about, which is like, we are all, we're practicing all of these skills with the, with the idea that someday we might operate, you know, in a team environment, we might work with some buddies. And if that's the case, man, I'd sure love to know that all my buddies are putting the safety on before they move, before they reload, before they come off target, all of these things. I'm, I'm just going to keep doing it. The battery of arms may be easier to teach, but it's not better. Well, that's what we have. I love AK. <laughs> oh, I'll be real. I don't always engage the safety. The Iraqi load, load where, you, where you pull the charging handle back with one hand and you do all the reloading with your left hand and then just let it go. Oh, but yeah. And the, yeah, you can let you can take both hands off the gun and it's so reliable that it'll chamber around on its way down to the ground. That's the platform we're talking about. 
Travis Should we talk about who and AK loads with one video? He spawned an entire generation of ruined AK guys. Mm -hmm. the, the less we say about Travis Haley, the better. Um, He's not mentioned much on primary and secondary. Hmm. So uh, I, I was, I was, I was, I was pissing alone, handsome. Um, the <laughs> shut the fuck up, Hawk. No one cares what the fuck you have to say. Um, so is this the more traditional reload? You just pull the mag out, put a new mag in, and then the whole swiping is dumb or? What's the concepts there with the ruined an entire generation of EK reloads? Well, it's it's the overhand. These guys make this exaggerated overhand come across and charge. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or underneath, or you know, he does it underneath. Okay. to come across and do all that. And guys, spend, I see it all the time at the AK specific matches. Mm. You, know, you watch the guys who do that, and they've practiced it, and it looks really cool. And you know, to people who want to look really cool, it looks cool. Um, but I see guys that are that are just what what used to be the term range theatrics. Yeah, you know, it was a lot of range back, to, back. Uh, to 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 load a gun that way, and I've never done it that way, and I'm never going to do it that way. What what's the uh, what's the OG like correct way of doing it then, if you don't mind me? Well, if you follow the Russian manual of arms, they come off the gun and charge it with the right hand. Oh they, yeah. Okay. So this awesome. Brock and I heard this recently when we did bullpup stuff. A lot of people, maybe with some some Israel Israeli conscript training, were saying that you should reload a bullpup entirely with the right hand. So you're supporting the gun with your or sorry, primary or dominant hand. So you're supporting the entire gun with your support hand. Take the magazine out, the magazine out of your chest rig, stick it back in, charge the gun, whatever that may be. All with the I, I have dominant the... hand. I have the best of both worlds. I'm a lefty, so the charging handle like just works better for me. And I'm also I'm also here. Satan spawn, so you know it comes with some trade offs. Unfortunately, um, I'm drinking. Guys, in Utah, I mean, yes, yeah, so you I'm don't have to be jealous of him because you know he's not getting into heaven. So just bide your time, and then laugh at him from the hereafter. I've seen some guys do it really fast. There's some guys who can really. Right. I've gotten some hops seen my reloads on an AK back when I ran an AK. I'm, I'm pretty fast. Like, yeah, you're fast as fuck, but who cares? I, I don't give a shit how fast you can reload. I shoot. Okay. I don't give a, yeah, I don't give a shit about anything that you can do because if I can't do it, it's not important. That's fair. It's a tool in the toolbox. It's no better. It's no worse. Well, at but this point, well, you're all right. Cause tool let me, let me tell you something. In the up, definition of a tool. My, my dad, of course, because yeah, he's a dad. Dads have tools. Uh, he had a whole shitload of tools, and one of the tools that he had was an old school was uh, twist drill. Oh. It was it was the AK of drills. It was a, a if a you don't have drill. power, that is it's awesome. Uh, if you don't have power for how long though? Because his other drills were battery powered. So if you didn't have power, you still had batteries. Right? Well, consider I mean, what Gary on. was just living through. Solar. So even if the Free power solar. goes out, he can still recharge his batteries. You're right. Good point. That does that does reinforce my argument. Thank you for making that. <laughs> uh, so I will tell you what, man, whenever I would go work on like projects and shit in the garage, you know, like making fucking sores out of out of a one by two lath or some bullshit. I sure loved using that twist drill because it's a lot more fun to be like, oh, I'm going to line it up and then I'm going to turn a little fucking thing. Very cool. Was that better than the than the Dewalt battery powered drill? No, probably not. Let's be honest. It was a tool. It was in the toolbox. It did accomplish the same task. It just did it a lot worse, a lot slower. And at the time that my dad undoubtedly purchased this tool, it was cheaper than an electric drill. Now I'm not really sure where you buy a hand-powered crank twist drill. I suspect you're going to have to dip into the hipster and so on and so forth market in order to find one of these reproduction or vintage hand-powered twist drills. So you may, in fact, end up paying more than you would, you know, going down to the lows and buying yourself a Black & Decker, you know, well, which electric is powered exactly battery where drill. The, that's exactly where the AK market is right now. You're paying, you're paying for. You're uh, paying more yeah. money yeah, for a, an inferior platform because it makes you feel special or different. And so in a in a world with this much interconnectivity that we have, you are constantly reminded how not special and how not different you are. And man, you are going to latch onto anything 
you can get your hands on that makes you feel a little bit special and a little bit different. But that's not so bad, right? <clears throat> Is it not? No, because... I mean, chances are we're, we're never going to use this equipment in a situation that matters. And our ability to use this equipment is, is, is the defining trait, not the equipment itself. So the things that keep us interested in the equipment in the long term is, is what matters. So if, if you need a goddamn AK to keep you keep you stoked to shit about training with firearms and to keep you passionate about it, then then so fucking be it, right? It's like the the guy who I, I wish I could remember his name because he's a, an inspiration to us all who decided he was going to shoot USPSA with a Glock 26 and became Grandmaster or some shit like that, whatever in his in his, you know, in his genre. And it's really proving the point that the actual equipment that you're using is really very immaterial to your overall success. And it's more about your skill level, your practice level, you know, your commitment to the sport. His chill, stock chill, Glock 26 was a lot better than the Tanfolio until you're trying to hit a coyote at 600 yards right okay sure <laughs> that just exposes the artifice of competition shooting which is that it's so far away from actual shooting that it almost might as well not even be a metric of performance but brock can tell you more about that than i can we really missed out on a competition rant last time i'm just saying i'm just saying it's not too late it is it is too late you, you well, think i right don't now. respect ak's man i don't respect anything he doesn't respect me and we're married exactly I just want to, I want you to flex your toolbox. Go get your toolbox. That's fine. That's all over there. I don't give a shit. I had a, I, I was filing down Midwest Industries parts so I could fit them on my fucking AK. Tell you what, man, I never had to do that shit with the AR platform. Yeah, but you no. hate the AR platform too. You just, you just. He likes my the GX4. GX4 is a fine handgun. Haven't had to fuck with that one yet. The nice thing about the uh, the AR platform is that the torque spec windows for everything is so wide, you can just guess and you're going to do it. Well, you mentioned something very specific earlier about assembling an AR and you said towel. Well, yes. it's for the, it's this, for the is launch, a, this is the an orbital. old school. This yeah. is a kind of an OG. Uh, I don't know if it's from fucking Reddit or 4chan or whatever, but, you know. Both despicable the, hives. The, of yeah, exactly. Them. Neither of them are like high quality uh, communities, but building an AR, there are a lot of like prescription proscriptions for how you should do it. Like, you know, you got to use arrow shell grease, you know, you got to torque the barrel nut to a certain mm -hmm. poundage, whatever. None of that stuff actually matters. Uh, dimple. So gas blocks pinned, dimpled, clamp on, or may I suggest Super glue. set screws with no dimples and you just tighten them and it's literally fine forever. I, I want to point out because on any budget slash modern AR that you build, the gas block is not exposed to abuse because it's under the handguard because of course, no self-respecting human being would have an exposed gas block. It looks weird. The internet will make fun of you for having exposed barrel, much less exposed gas block. You know, about so, the ex the, yeah. I know I know full well about this. Yeah, shit. I've so, the shit out of you for that one. So I have like, whatever, it doesn't matter. So the it thing is like, I've had lot, several dude. AR builds where I had a set screw gas block with no dimples, no pinning. And it was just height. Well, let, the, you let, know, let's whatever. Skip this and they go, they go multiple thousands of rounds with no pinning. No, it's not just no multiple thousands no of rounds. I burnt out two barrels in my time is because I shoot on like, ridiculous amount it's not practical amounts of shooting i'm not getting massive training value out of this i'm getting some training value out of he this shoots hair. too much and too fast i got first place suck my dick um the i shoot a lot no no suck suck not hand like i need the full no, no that's this is you yeah but then you need to mm. no okay so you know I, I i shoot a lot i burnt out two barrels and it, well it turns out that Brass facts retard in the like on his carpet because he does no longer owns a table that can handle his C clamp block thing. Just building an air fleet or air 15 on his carpet, uh, that also has to buy multiple, you know, springs and detents because about 50% of those are going to end up in orbit and show up six months later. Um, I now do it in the bathroom with the curtain, the curtains closed. Uh, yeah, that you have a, an air well. vent in there, be careful. Yeah, but I can lift that air vent up and go grab it. 
Oh, but it's gross to put your hand down in there, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little gross. Yeah, it's yeah, I wouldn't gross. do that. Yeah, but that's no, why I, falls in there. That, that, that's why I'm the the more intense one in the relationship, right? Like so. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. I, I love me some dimples, and when you put the cross pin in, it's like, oh, it makes me feel so good and warm and fuzzy on the inside. But in practically speaking, it's like, dude, I, like I burn, I burn out the barrels before these gas blocks come apart. So I don't. Brock know said he wasn't going to drink about. tonight, but I think he's drinking tonight. So that that explains just what so the fuck. Huh, you're the one that <sighs> I never said I wasn't going to drink tonight. Yeah, I wasn't going to drink tonight because I have to drink no. tomorrow night. And then I need to prepare for this trip we're doing in five days where we're just going to drink fucking seven nights in a row. Dude, my poor fucking liver, man. I can't. We're going to be so responsible this time. We're going to be for so real responsible. This time. Bend, Oregon is going to be like, yeah, yeah. Bend, Oregon is is, is going to enact some it's, new it's legislation. It's not even like they've got like a shitload of microbreweries operating. Yeah, but there's no Bend, alcohol Oregon. in those fucking now. drinks. I'm bringing bourbon like. I'm, I'm talk so about sorry that you guys had I'm to experience our, uh, cranberry juice. Is there? Is there? It's good. Yeah, it's good for your health. Is there else in that cranberry juice? Probably it's... ice and cup. Raspberry there we go. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Vodka and homemade cranberry juice. God bless America. That's... Fortified with vitamins and uh, spring water. Yep. See, I, I wasn't going to get passionate tonight, but Hop is Hop is um, you know he's pushing your through. buttons. Well, it's not pushing my button. See, with my counselor, we talked about this. There are certain, you know, like boxes that we want to avoid crossing and and he agrees to them. And like Hop said, like we, he want, he, you know, he's, he's contingent on our marriage and he doesn't want to, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> That's you sound, shit. you sound drunk right now, sir. <laughs> I do. You sound I, like I've you're shoot, out of control. I've been shooting since, I've been shooting since like 11. I haven't had anything to eat and I'm I was gonna go take a saloon. Okay. I mean, I, I'm I'm a very binary human being. Either I'm not gonna say anything, or I'm going to. I've seen that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll I'll either not I'll hold my tongue, or I'll make enemies out of ninety percent of the audience. So I guess obviously we hit the the critical mass here, and we're into type two. So armor. Yeah, Gary uh -oh. has some experience with armor. Yeah, lots of that. What are you seeing right now? That's a conversation that got even worse recently, didn't it? It Not always so. gets worse. Gets are are worse there some things that worse. you're seeing? Uh, well, there was an another. Gosh, what company was it? It was in Tesco. It was was it RMA that had a very recent blowout of like oh no, shoot, I don't remember what company it was, but so, uh, sorry, no, it was a uh, shot stop. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where better. it was like, oh shit! Turns out these plates were maybe foreign made the entire time. And when people were started messaging me, they were like, "Hey man, did you know that Shotstop may not have been legitimate?" And I was like, "You might have missed the scandal three or four years ago when people realized that Shotstop plates had massive cheater rings around them because they could they could make their plates appear. You know, they were rated level four, but they weighed like level three A or three and whatever three plus. And it's like, well, how do they do that? The answer is massive foam cheetah rings because oh, yeah. the the standards for testing only specify impacts two inches in from the outboard plate so as opposed to like i've got a bunch of uh, ltc plates those are the plates that i use those are ceramic plates with just like a quarter inch of foam around the outside to protect them from damage uh but if the testing specifies an impact two inches from the edge well then gosh you surely don't need ceramic all the way to the edge the edge could be foam the inch and a half between the edge and the center could also be foam and you'd be totally fine you're still going to pass the testing and your plate's going to look a lot lighter on paper and also you can make it a lot cheaper because you're using less materials and when that came out about shot stop plates deridium plates as resold by Faro and maybe some other companies when i saw that i was like oh fuck, well fuck those guys then and people would ask me for advice about plates and i'd say don't fucking buy shot stop because it looks like they're they're cheating with huge cheater ranks turns out they were also maybe were cheating with where the plates were made kind of a bummer but like, went all whatever that, right? well is there some combination or some interaction between when uh, gbrs ferro concepts forward observations group i don't know they all seem kind of like the same people to me but as much as I love Ferro Concepts, I would never tell anybody to buy their fucking armor plates because they really looked bullshit. 
And then Hesco, same thing with Hesco. I I have owned Hesco plates. I don't think I have any right now, but apparently Hesco is like got the the worst track record with like their plates According failing periodic audits. Well, Reddit, where else does mm. information come from these days? But every once in a while, you'll hear these stories about like, oh, Hesco failed another audit. So now there's a possibility that anybody with a Hesco plate's got a bad Hesco plate. Now so that's actually a topic Gary and I have talked about. And uh, with the misunderstandings of where the failures actually come from or where a certification is, how it's withdrawn or why it's withdrawn. And it may not be directly related to a failure, but it's actually products replacing it. And there's no reason to retest it. So was that the there was I don't want to say it was uh, RMA, but there was another company where. Arma had one recently. Was this they, recently where where they pulled. Um, well, here's, here's where the, the NIJ said this. this failed, and they said it did not, and they maintained like they they weren't even RMA, like that's RMA. We failed, but we're gonna try again. They were like, no, they fucked up, and that happens too. Well, yeah, exactly. Because of course the NIJ the test, isn't gonna be test inf labs, infallible. Test labs are not infallible, um, and they do make mistakes. We had a, a my company that I work for. We had a a, a female decertification and it was decertified because it failed on submersion testing and the reason it failed on submersion testing is because the fucking asshole that cut the box open cut the fucking pad cover with a razor knife um <laughs> i wish i could say i haven't done that i i once bought a, a tent and i forgot that i'd ordered a tent so a package showed up on my doorstep and i was like oh i wonder what this is <laughs> opened it up and it's a tent and there's a a big slice in the the stuff sack for the tent, and a big slice in the tent itself. And I was yeah, like, "It's a pretty good uh, box cutter you got but there." But that buddy. still, <laughs> you know, for the company that and what in what did a, I do? In a letter. I I was like, "Can I return this? It's got a hole in it." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But for the company, you know, like for us, that results in a in a in a naughty letter. We call it, you know, a failed fit test. It goes out, and they say, "Hey, just so you know, this this product is." you know, keep continue wearing it, you know, whatever. And it takes months and months for a manufacturer to clear something up like that and get it listed back. Um, because, and it can happen for something as simple as the guy got too aggressive with a box knife. Um, and you know, RMA's explanation of what happened with their plate seemed actually totally, you know, plausible to me. I've had a lot of other issues with some of their marketing practices, you know, and some of the things like that, the way that they advertise their plates and, take liberty with threat designations and, you know, so on and so forth. But it's entirely plausible that what they say happened at the test lab happened, you know, based on personal experience. But the armor market in general, much like the gun market, as we were discussing earlier, has become pervasively intruded by marketeers who are pushing products to the consumer side to and and not just the consumer side, but even the LE side, I think Matt would agree. It's a very low information consumer. Yeah. Um, they don't really know what the threat levels are. So you can take liberty with saying what the threats are. They don't really know what the NIJ testing is. And so a lot of companies really take a lot of liberty with what they say the plates will and won't do. Um, and to the point where when you're talking about, when we're talking about guns, we're talking about I like AKs, you like ARs, you know, whatever. The odds are realistically, they'll probably both work. Um, and the, also the odds are that probably realistically, even though we act as though they will, you probably never have to bet your life to a rifle plate or a piece of soft body armor for a law enforcement officer, however, that's a little bit different. Um, so I get really upset at some of the marketing practices, you know, that I see. And one of my issues with those companies that have been mentioned has been primarily marketing practice. And frankly, I had the shot stop guy come to me at shot show, I don't know, 2020 timeframe. And he said, well, because we, my company, we make soft armor. We design, develop, test, and make our own soft armor. We private label hard armor. Um, and I put out a spec to different manufacturers and say, this is what I want. What do you have? Send me what you have. Then we'll, send it in, insert it under our own name or just get a, you know, cert in our name. <laughs> so as far as hard armor goes is I don't really have a dog in the fight as far as manufacturing goes. Um, but I do get to see what everybody has and I do get to shoot what everybody has. And I do get to say what I want 
um, you know, to get from those companies and shot stop was very elusive. And once I told them what I wanted, they never got back to me, <laughs> you know, they just never, they just kind of ignored the sales call. Um, but the NIJ 07 announcement finally, after years and years of waiting, it really needed to happen for rifle plates. Uh, soft armor, the changes they made for, for the soft armor standard are going to have big impacts to the consumer and big impacts to the manufacturer, but it's really just a materials thing. They're going to get thicker. They're going to get heavier. They may get a little more flexible, but they're certainly going to get more expensive. Uh, but they didn't really change the threat cartridges. And it, I don't think people were too confused about nomenclature, you know, level two, level three, a HG one, HG two, but rifle plates were a landmine ridden yeah. environment for a consumer and particularly a professional user to navigate. And I think that the, the most positive thing to come out of 07 will be clarification um, and standardization of threats and also, you know, nomenclature for rifle plates, because what I say a three plus was may not be what so-and-so said a three yeah. plus plus was, you know, um, there's things I don't like, you know, I don't particularly personally, this isn't my company. This is me personally. I think the inclusion of a surrogate projectile for mild steel core seven, six, two by 39 is kind of asinine. Um, we have to deal with it though. That's what they're going to do. And in the meantime, they're going to use Chinese ammo, you know, until they can find somebody's cousin to make the, surrogate projectile um and frankly mild steel core 762 by 39 is not that common anymore you know you just you just you can find it if you're looking for it but you just don't see it regularly like you do a lot of the others it's certainly not as common as m855 um which you go anywhere and buy but uh that's the, that for me, that's the big upside for professional users. 207 is the changes to the rifle plate standard and the standardization. And also to your point about how the spacing and shot spacing is on the plates. Um, you couldn't really certify anything smaller than a 10 by 12 plate because of those spacing requirements, you know, for six shots for a level three. And now the ability to certify for three hits instead of six on a, on a level three plate, it's going to, I think that's going to have a, a big impact in the number of certified plates in smaller than 10 by 12 sizes, which will be a good thing for, for the consumers, for the users. But I was kind of wondering about that. This is, I mean, I, I know absolute dog shit about this sort of thing, but the idea of like multi-hit rating is if a person is stitched up with multiple shots, you know, outside of a, of an AN94 hyperburst or some kind of salvo projectile system, are you taking two shots in the plate at any conceivable range, or is it more likely that they will be two separate? You know, it always it always seemed a little bit strange to me the idea of like, yeah, you got to hit two hits in the exact same spot. I kind of would suspect that if you are if someone is able to hit you multiple times in the plate, they're probably going to hit you multiple times in other parts of the body as well. Yeah, well, and they do have the spacing requirements, so they do they do space them out. So they're not stacked, you know, they're not stacked or anything. But based on how you had to space them and how far in you had to be from the edge, you couldn't get enough shots on anything smaller than a ten by twelve. And so, in order to have an, a certified eight by ten, you had to have a ten by twelve and prove to them that the construction was identical to be able mm -hmm. to have a certified eight by ten. But they didn't test it, which smaller armor doesn't always work the same way larger armor does. And that's hey, what we talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, like with soft armor, why they came up with the template sizes C1 through C5, because manufacturers were sending in literal horse, horse blankets, blankets, you know, for, for certification. Um, <sighs> and they didn't work when you shrunk them. Um, it's not so much the case with rifle plates, but I think that certified is better than not certified. And I would rather have a certified eight by 10 certified for three hits than have an eight by 10 that was certified because the 10 by 12 passed. Um, I think that's a, that's peace of mind for the consumer. And now, you know, that the level four multi-hit thing, there was no multi-hit level four. 
Um, that was a manufacturer individual thing. That was a single hit certification. And some manufacturers would say, we have a multi-hit level four. And sometimes they would cert, dual cert it. They'd say, well, we shot it to NIJ level three, so it's multi-hit on three, but it's also four and it's a single hit 30-06M2 AP. Um, and the inclusion in 07 of the ability to certify, I believe it's one, two, three, and six hits for a level four is also a is also a beneficial thing for the end user. Uh, the soft armor stuff is not so much beneficial. It's going to lead to a lot of, I think, hate and discontent for a while. But the hard armor stuff, I think, for the most part, is positive. And specifically, as we've done, Matt, at your training summits, mm -hmm. um, the inclusion of the M193 cartridge for RF1 certification pretty much eliminates AR500 from being NAJ certified which is good for everybody. What about the inclusion of M855 and poly stuff? Well, that's the other benefit because the biggest predatory marketing thing that I see right now from a professional user standpoint and consumer side, um, there's a lot of all polyethylene plates. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're neutrally buoyant. Yeah, they're neutrally buoyant. They're two pounds. Yeah. And, People love it. They love and the they're defeated by very common ammo. Defeated by the most common rifle and ammunition combination in the United States. Doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, um, especially for professional, you know, user. So I think that RF2 is going to just straight up eliminate that confusion. Because right now, as a stopgap measure, you had manufacturers saying, oh, well, that you need a three plus for that. But some manufacturers say three plus, yep. smiles to a core 762 by 39. And then they say plus plus is m855 and mild steel core 762 by 39 and so there was just no standardized language to know what that meant and then you had some manufacturers like one of the aforementioned people who just had some stuff delisted who would come out of their ass with a 3a plus you know just making things up just for marketing purposes so 2.9 yeah, 07 is going to do some good shit for the rifle plate market. It's going to eliminate a lot of confusion um, for both consumers and professional users, and hopefully for the industry salespeople as well. Because I've had, if there's one industry where people who sell products know less about it than firearms, it's body armor. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the uh, HG One Plus. Yeah, HG One Plus Plus. Yeah, because there's three A plus. Well, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of new woven materials, um, Kevlar EXO, and you know things like that. There's gonna be a lot more woven fabrics used in armor for 07 for soft armor than right now. Right now the ultra high molecular weight polyethylenes, um, laminates, UDs, you know, they're kind of the king of the roost right now for soft armor. But with the requirement under 07 that soft armor be shot to the same velocity conditioned, so after they're simulated aging or accelerated aging, it has to shoot to the same velocities as they do when they were new. Um, even though it's only 5%, it's a 5% difference from it currently from condition to, to, to new. It's only 5% different, but the difference that that's going to make in the materials that get chosen for the vests that are going to be submitted for 07 is significant. Body armor is about to go thicker and heavier. And with all of this, that doesn't make the vest that I have now that's rated to the old system all of a sudden obsolete. No, and I tell people right now, personally, my opinion is right now is actually a really good time to buy soft armor. Yeah. Um, because right now you're buying the state of the art. You're buying the pinnacle of technology that's going to happen under 06. It's not going to be like there's a new iPhone come out next month. Um, you know, that you're buying the best soft body armor that you can get today. The standard is totally adequate. It's not an unsafe standard. There's not a lot of product failures or, you know, problems with the body armor that's out there that's certified 06. 
you're getting the pinnacle of technology and the service life of that product being five years, the introduction of 07, they're going to start submitting vests for testing April of next year. Oh, wow. Um, all of us, that's the soonest we can submit them for testing. Interesting. Everybody that's reputable already has a vest that they know is going to pass. Um, <laughs> but they're not going to start testing till April. And NIJ, I am told, is actually going to withhold letters, certification letters, until they feel like there's a suitable number of certified vests to provide competition. Um, so in other words, even though I've already got an 07 vest certified and I can submit it in and race to be the first guy to get an 07 vest to market, I will not receive an approval letter from NIJ. Interesting. Till point blank pack, uh, you know, what, blah, 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 blah. So Just to make sure that there's not an unfair advantage. Right. That's interesting. What so I'm told they're going to hold letters until they feel like enough manufacturers have 07 cert armor that they're comfortable with, you know, putting it out. It'll be probably third quarter of next year before you see a piece of 07 certified soft armor or part armor for that matter. But Do with you, the imminent yeah. arrival of the HK SB7, is any of this stuff going to stop the 47 or the 46 cartridge that's about to uh, flood the market? 46 like HK M MP7? Um, not, not likely in soft armor. Um, well the, then why even bother the, I actually was really, I've been reliably gonna, informed. This is about to take off. I was, I was the, the, the real significant threat. There's, there's two real significant handgun threats that, um, are still not accounted for by NIJ 07. Um, and it's because they consider them not to be prevalent. Um, five, seven being one of them. I mean, it's not a huge secret, you know, the, because it is a, a somewhat common cartridge and it is gaining popularity. I mean, hell, PSA. Because people are dumb. <clears throat> you know, me. Ruger makes them, PSA makes hmm, them. Wow. Make them, you know, <laughs> they... Uh, you got the I same weird kind of cold that I've got. That if they were going to revisit the standard, why they wouldn't do a, an inclusion for for the 5.7, at least for like SS-197. But they didn't. But it's still a special threat cert. You can still choose to do abbreviated testing, and most reputable manufacturers will choose to do abbreviated special threat testing for it, which we will, our company will. But 4.6 will probably be like M855A1, where it's not a super prevalent threat and probably never will be. Though, so, talking to people within our circle, they're swearing up and down, 4.6 is better than 5.7. But we're talking about it, the application of it in PDW full auto subguns. I, mean, I wonder if it, give, if it gets go. through your body armor, then uh, it has about the effectiveness of a. Not even. Six, a six millimeter Flobert, which we talked about last time, a parlor cartridge. And you wouldn't wear armor to defeat yeah, that it's, shit. It's, so uh, why even worry about it? You'd be surprised when it yeah, actually, right. when stuff actually does make it through the armor. There's not a lot of energy transfer or it would have stopped. <laughs> so if it goes through the armor, it still usually has quite a bit of ass behind it. In the I just like the uh, the Paul Harrell test where he fired, I think it was M855, but he fired it through a level two vest into some gel. And he realized that the level two vest drastically increased the effectiveness of the, of the green tip because it started tumbling before it hit the gel rather than afterwards. Mm. Yeah. He's like, that's wow, a, that's a big issue with, uh, goodness MA gracious. Yeah. Where it's like, it, it tumbles outside of the body essentially like, wow, that's some pretty good terminal effect you got there on air. It's like the home defense argument. Yeah. It's like a, a round of M855 going sideways will still penetrate a level three vest and make you explode from the inside out. So I hate when that happens. At least it wasn't it's not my groceries. biggest fear, but it's one of them. Well, we just got the, we've got the 30 out six M two AP here. So stay off my lawn. That's right. Those, are those level four plates? <laughs> I I do wonder about that, and I always love the the argument of like, oh, you're preparing for all this sort of shit. You know, you got your Hesco thirty eight tens. You know, your level three plus. It's supposed to stop a you know a fifty five, but what happens when that boomer with the 243 Winchester takes a shot at you? It's like, hey, Matt, I've met enough 
you know, old dude hunters, like that rifle is not zeroed. That rifle, if if it's zeroed at all, it's zeroed for his flinch. And I'm not so worried about that, man. Like to be perfectly honest. Well, you know, most of the most of the hunting class calibers and hunting bullets, they're soft. I mean, you you gotta have the whole thing, right? To to get penetration. It's gotta be small, hard, and fast. The part you're missing there is hard. So when you have the polycarbonate tipped soft point, you know, whatever, they just expand and they don't yeah. really parachute. parachute. I, I would get guys um, a lot like in Montana. I'd go up and they'd say, well, we want to see a plate shot, but we want to shoot it with 338, <laughs> you know, trophy bonded, bear claw, blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, okay. And we'd shoot it and they go, well, that's got so much power. And, you know, I'm, yeah, but muzzle velocity, the, the bullet is soft. You know I mean? You have muzzle energy. Have, you got to have all those things. It's, it's not just one thing. You've got to have the combination of things to be able to, you know, poke hole in a plate. And frankly, luckily most rifle centerfire rifle hunting cartridges and the ammunition that they fire, particularly the ammunition they fire. I mean, if you had somebody who was pulling bullets and loading M855 and 22250 or something and had the gun twisted, right? You know, that'd be a different story. Um, but, you know, ballistic tip, blitz king, you know, whatever, they're just, they're soft <clears throat> and they, they do what they're made to do, which is expand, which doesn't lead to penetration in armor. Or so I'm told. <laughs> I'm so, I just want to say, I, I am so proud of these two for not making snide remarks about small, hard, and fast. Small, hard, and fast. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, I didn't say small. anything, but I think you could see it on my face. Oh, I, I, I only got small <laughs> over here. What can I say? I actually did a a, a white paper uh, on uh, UHMP or yes. ultra high density molecular. Fuck, I hate that. Ultra so high molecular weight polyethylene. Yeah, and, and and I talked about like the the slow motion and the 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 molecular. So the interesting thing with that is when the when the bullet strike. Okay, this is nerdy as fuck. No one gives a shit. But no, uh, no, no. Please, please, I get I get to talk about this. Where do you think you are? <laughs> exactly. When the bullet when the bullet strikes plastic, it. it actually it shifts the 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 polymer or the the composite polymer into a uh, the the liquid state for a second, and then the polymer begins shifting around the the round, and it actually transitions back to the solid state during this. And you actually get even though the bullet cross sectional area because it, it like that that that's what armor penetration is about. It's cross sectional impulse about like how much damage are you doing per cross sectional area, and with with uh, ultra high molecular weight uh, polyethylene it actually increases because you're melting it and then it's re-solidifying mm. during the process so it's it's a really interesting thing um all the uh college people looked at me weird when i talked about uh you know why inter internal terminal performance of a, a bullet on a human body well meanwhile everyone else is like well the the lifespan of a solar panel and the effect on global warming will be but yeah it, this, it's, 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 this was weeks after virginia virginia tech so i mean true yeah you can see why people were looking sort of sideline at him but but it's it's, it's a super cool thing I, I don't know too much about it we we did do a, a study where I, I we my group for some reason it was like three vets you know one dude that uh that was in uh, uh oif got blown up by a fucking rpg uh we, we were trying to make uh ceramics for uh body armor right we were trying like 98 percent uh, alumina and 95 percent of alumina fuck it we're just gonna google it uh Way, way off topic. Well, now, you're going to see a lot less ultra high molecular weight polyethylene used in 07. A yeah. lot less. And yeah, yeah. It, it, it's ultimately like it's 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 just material wise, but but the mechanism is different because, <laughs> or interestingly different because you know everything else is just crush path and all that stuff. But with with ultra high molecular weight, there's a there's a different mechanism at play. But it's still it's still polymer and polymer is weak sauce, but. Well, it is when you heat it over 200 degrees. Yeah, and you'll, you'll get that heat real quick when you, you hit it with something the size of a fucking, you know. Come yep. What if you hit it with a poopsicle? Uh, uh, no yeah. no survivors. It's over. <laughs> Poo pudding. Yes, that's the worst. That's the dangerous one. I'm really interested, plasma. though. 
that, that's a special threat. That's a special yes. threat. You got to add on to that. Yeah. I'm, I'm really interested to find out what happens when 07 is then we're well established in 07. How many of these armor companies disappear? I don't know. We, now, we can't do that anymore. Off armor metric. I don't, I don't know how many will disappear. I don't, I, they, the consumer side will just figure out a new marketing game. Um, Air 500 is going to have to, they, yeah. I, I am told that mostly the stand, the holdup with the standard was stink from AR 500 plate manufacturers bitching about the inclusion of M193 for RF, RF1. Um, I don't, I, that's secondhand, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm told a big part of the holdup was. When you they, say AR 500 manufacturers, you mean just, just one or is, is it actually a big conglomerate? Oh, there are lots of companies selling that garbage. Well, I'm curious if it's just that one company or is it, is it, it's primarily one company that okay so that, that's uh, what i was yeah okay. yeah it, it, i'm told it was primarily one company but you know all the major everybody had to have some kind of air 500 plate because when you're talking about government side you have bids and you have specs so if a bid spec comes out and you want to be competitive you have to have something to meet that bid spec so a lot of companies have ar 500 products even though they you know some of them try not to sell them. Some of them don't know any better. Some of them actively push it. And the ones that I have the most issue with are the ones who actively push it for professional side. I mean, consumer side, that's, that's let the buyer beware, you know what I mean? <laughs> but on the professional side, I think you have a somewhat of a moral obligation to make sure the consumer is educated. And I've always- One of the that. things I find very reassuring about that is, you know, I know that M193 or MA55 will perform a lot better than your average, you know, two to three lead core ball ammo. But I also know that the average person is mostly stocked up on, you know, Tula. They don't have PMC X-Tac, they got PMC Bronze. PMC X-Tac may in fact go through your shitty armor. PMC Bronze will not because it sucks because it's low velocity, it's lead core. And I'm not so fucking worried about it. Same thing to like the guy, you know, the boomer that's got the 243 Winchester, like, man, that's some high velocity shit. That's going to go through a lot of armor. But remember that rifle's zeroed to his flinch. He's been taking deer for multiple years, but he's taking those shots at, you know, 45 yards deer. That's, you know, just a handful of paces away from him. That corn tastes awfully feeder. good. Yeah, yeah, I know the guy is like, yeah, it's worked for me. It's like, yeah, because the deer's no, never been more than about, 15 feet away from you because you're up in a tree stand and it's down there at the feeder like sure you can take that shot <laughs> but also remember that you know your optic is a is a uh a tasco pronghorn three to nine by 50 and Specificity. Uh, the uh i used to own one of those the odds that you're gonna see me before i see you is pretty low so fuck it and your gun's not zeroed and your cartridge is bullshit so I'm not overly concerned about that more than I am about the guy who's like, I got the five, five, six, it'll zip through armor. It's like, no man, you got the two, two, three. And it doesn't do none of that shit. That's a big pet peeve of mine. Like everyone's talking about, like, I got to get my 20 inch M16, you know, load. I'm going to plate check you, bro. You're and not. then none of them You're are running, running the correct ammunition velocity wise. Cause it's, there's, there's not much out there. And that's why it, like it, it's a oh fuck. I hate I hate green tip, but like green tip is actually very consistent on velocity because there's a very specific spec you have to aim for it to be classified as that. And then you know, M A uh, M one ninety three. Like a lot of the shits only you know doing four hundred FPS lower than because it's actually two two three. It, it's a it's a whole a whole topic. But people will ask you. They'll be like, about the ammo? Is it is it legit green tip? And you'll be like, well, does the head stamp say Lake City? And they say no. And then you say. Well, then there's your answer. No. <laughs> if it's not Lake City, it's probably not legit green tip. It's probably not legit M193. Go ahead and chrono that shit. It's probably going to come in well under expectation. Yeah. Maybe like, you'll get lucky. Maybe you'll get like, you know, uh, IMI Razor Core shit. They, it seems like, I don't know if Israel just never had access to 20 inch ARs. Maybe they just, I mean, they got all the surplus 14 fives and now they built their own shit. I have all the tab tabors. They loaded a lot of their stuff a little bit hotter. So it seems like IMI ammo is usually hotter from shorter barrels than you'd expect. So maybe that's fine. Maybe IMI green tip is 
fast enough to be green tip and same thing with one uh m193 but boy that fucking pmc bronze or the frontier i want to say if it doesn't say lake city i just don't believe in it at this point i'm a norma gang well, and I've well, shot a bunch of it at armor demos, and I use a lot of like agency supplied ammo. And uh, there is actually a lot of PMC, and you know, like whatever PMC calls it, a gold or whatever. I don't know. I open the fucking box and I look at it. Fifty-five gram full metal jacket, Chrono. It it's still hitting like between thirty fifty and thirty one fifty. Oh, um, you got you got X tech. If it's X tech, yeah, X tech's <laughs> yeah. good shit. If yeah. it's bronze, you're it's you're not you're, good. <laughs> yeah, you're three oh eights out fucking speeding you at with with bronze. Like out forty five ACP is is out speeding you. That yeah, bronze is you could be throwing a bowling ball down the alley. Uh, I, I did like a graph and all that stuff. And it's bronze. Like, you can run bronze in a twenty inch barrel and have the performance of a ten five with full speed. You know, MA five five. Like it's that bad. And it, I just swap it for fucking really M one ninety or IMI yeah. stuff because the and IMI stuff really is disgusting. loaded weird. Yeah, those those motherfuckers are crazy. That that shit's all loaded hot. Um, yeah, I it's it's an interesting flash. dynamic that people like don't consider. It's like, dude, some of the stuff that's labeled at three thousand feet per second is three thousand feet per second out of a twenty inch or twenty six inch barrel. It's like, yeah, yeah. twenty four inch varmint barrel. They're also, I mean, as long as the bullet gets out of the barrel, they're not really worried about it because it's not going to cause like a an explosive problem that you're going to come after them later. You're not going to be like, hey man, your your ammo blew up my gun. If it makes it out of the barrel, even if it just goes, that's good. That's a win for them. So it, I, I do find it. I was actually talking to Sandy the other night, my wife, and <clears throat> we were watching some old West movie. And I had brought up the point that the difference between, you know, the proliferation of guns, you know, all that kind of stuff. They talk about the old West and you, these guys that were gunfighters and the difference. And I, it's the same as it is now. It's people who shoot. Um, just having a gun doesn't make you a gunfighter. And it was the same back then. And it's the same now. And I had brought up the point with her that I think that percentage wise, today we probably have a much higher percentage of guys who if they were in that time and had the same means and capacity there would be a lot more gunfighters today than there were then because people have the means and the capacity to research and shoot and the yeah, disposable income to do it yeah proficiency and the difference between a bill hickok um you know and just your average clay allison or whatever you know they 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 were all drunk and shooting and it was just guys that were willing to pull the trigger or guys who had shot a little bit like hickok was probably a shooter a little bit they say he shot every morning um but the the thing that you guys are talking about and you're bringing up the the fud with his 243 and all that is that guy's not the threat it's the guy who shoots a lot and regardless of what he's doing he's a threat and he's going to have the tools and equipment and the skill set to cause problems for people who don't. And that I think guy's that always has the potential to get lucky and ruin your day. Because well, no, I've already the I've cartridge already and that. the rifle could still instantly kill you past your armor. And the odds of the guy that's actually going to make that hit may be low, but yeah, the threat's still there. Whereas, I've, like, I, I mean, I've already you seen... put a, uh, like a Caleb Giddings, you put Caleb Giddings as a third party to the OK Corral shootout, he'll he'll kill both sides without taking a scratch probably because he has the ability to train to a much higher level of, of proficiency, regardless of the fact that he's shooting a 38 snub nose with literally no more muscle velocity or, you know, muscle energy than anything that they had access to at the time. Just the fact is like the guy can draw, shoot and reload more accurately and faster than anybody probably could back at that time. Yeah. Because well, the I've standard is so much higher that, we consider him a good shooter now. Back then, he would have been some kind of fucking, you know, uh, Mr. Manhattan, you know, just yep. making people explode kind of character. I've seen my death already. You want to hear it? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to get shot. How is this happening? Poopsicle. I'm going to get <laughs> shot through and through. A frozen poopsicle dislodges from yep. the eaves, and you're just like, you're out there just shoveling snow, and it's, 
screaming right through the top of your head into the bottom of your jaw, just a poop sickle. Nope, I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to get shot through and through by, by, a Sandy. Guy from, by a guy from California, and he's hunting deer, and he has the green commando sweater and the yellow aviator, yellow tint aviator glasses, and he's got the wool padded sling with the thumb hole on it, and he's got that obnoxious bird's eye maple California Weatherby stock. And it's a 300 Weatherby and he's doing reconnaissance by fire into a quakey stand to see if he can get a deer to run out of it. Oh boy. Unfortunately sitting there. So, so not too long ago, brass wax and I were, were trying to film. We weren't even really shooting that day. We were trying to just film a conversation. So we drove out to the desert. We sat on the bed of my truck. We set up a camera. We were trying to just get like a natural conversation about bull pups followed by a natural conversation about SPR builds that we had at the time. Uh, and while we're setting up, some FUDs roll up. They set up their target. We're looking at them. Brass Facts uh, doesn't really care what other people think about him or what's going on. So he's very blind to just the social aspect of, of any encounter. But I'm extremely self-conscious. So I'm like, these what guys the are going to start shooting. Nodding. They're going to start doing some fucking well, shit. Everybody agrees that you have just social blindness to this kind of thing. Uh, so they start setting up. I'm like, I don't like what's going on here. He's like, let's just film. And I'm like, no, 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 we should leave. We should go out. We should go to a different state to film this video because these people are about to start shooting. Sure enough, they start shooting like at us. And they're not hitting us. They're not hitting their target, probably. I have no fucking clue, but they probably weren't. They're just like shooting in our general direction. And he was right. He was right. We had no reason to be worried. We should have just kept filming our shit exactly where we were because they were not capable of hitting their own target or us. And the odds are, are pretty low. But that's just, yeah, I mean, that's that's the odds of it, right? It's like <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people... Uh, are capable of shooting in the direction of a target. Very few people are capable of actually shooting the target itself. Well, it seems like that's been that way forever. Regardless of proliferation, there's still very few dangerous men. Not from lack of trying, but <laughs> just from lack of ability. So which so, one you the most there, Matt? Which one in the back there is your... Do I shoot? Have I shot the most? Which ones Cham are here? Chambers. Yeah. Chambers? Yeah. That one I definitely have the most rounds on. After that would probably be a Glock and then PDP. Uh-oh, not the PDP again. Yes. Yeah. Um... So I really think that some kind of a collaboration would be really cool. Uh, poopsicles? Yes. And we shoot them. We put them through armor. <laughs> um, I am willing to donate for science one of those AK kits I have for us to get together and put something together and have that firsthand experience to see how it's done correctly. Well, when I get it's the shot not back, running, going to that. matter. But think of the experience. Oh, okay. The experience. I see. Yes. Of the poopsicle. Of the poopsicle. Where does your weapon light go? Using duct, tape. Duct tape. Yeah, I was about to say duct uh, tape is nope, nope, disqualified. No, nope. use a uh, clamps Bob. disqualified. SpongeBob tape. That's Pink some Doobie Ashley shit right there. It is. Hell, we could even have him fly He's out. more into explosives these days. The man yes, has no is. time for AK setups. Yes, he is. Also, I mean, show me the uh, picture. Does your air survive a ham sandwich? Sure. I eat the sandwich. My AR keeps... What the, the fuck even will question your is that? AK survive a ham sandwich? I could also see us do a... And now I'm, I'm, I'm in this club, by the way. Uh, armor shoots. That could be interesting to show people. This is what it's about. This is what's actually happening. It's worth reminding. I actually us have, for a, a, second I have a, here a video I've been wanting to do about Shut that. Shut the fuck up for a second, Hop. Uh, Hop's guys, not in you. Guys come. Just you guys by the come, way, that's like a ten-hour drive for him. Seven nine two Kurtz. Yes. Oh, is is that is that from uh, PSA? I think they made. Uh, oh no. wow. <laughs> Hold on. That's like literally you. three hundred blackout tier, except it's more expensive and it shoots out of a worse rifle. 
<laughs> yeah, you can come shoot our Lord and Savior seven nine two Kurtz if you come out. Oh, good. No, time. I'm not. I'm not as racist as you are, so I'm not that big of a fan of the SMG four four. Well, I mean, Max, you were trying to make a point about how people think I live with you, but I actually don't. I actually have my yeah. own life and friends and and like state. You don't have any friends, but you certainly have your own life. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got people who tolerate me. That's about what, the same roof. Thing. Do you guys see the comments? No, not him. Like the that? live chat. The, I see the live chat. I because there's a, I also see the YouTube comments. I just try not to read them because they demoralize me too oh, too much. Because there is a from T Howells. When is Hop moving to Utah? I'd imagine that long distance relationship, or I'd imagine that long distance relationships are very difficult. They are. We they just are. told uh, the Oregon House Measure One Fourteen to get fucked, so I'm not moving. That was the. I mean, that might have been able to get me to move. Probably not because I do love the state. Uh, but it got, it got forestalled. It got fucking completely stomped on. So I'm staying. It's the best state in the country. So what do you, what are you thinking, Gary? Like, uh, spring? Yeah. When the summer, mud, when mud season's over. Yeah. You have mud. So, season. so, so mudsicles now. Okay. Our best shoot, uh, happened during Utah's Rasputitsa. It was it was called Operation Mudslide. It's one of the best shoots we've ever done, and both of our vehicles got completely caked up in mud to the point where when I took my truck in to get like an oil change, the dealership was like, "Could you clean this before you bring it in next time?" And I was like, "No, because I'm paying for you to do this work." If I didn't want it to be clean, I would have done the work. It's, an oil change is not so difficult. I can't do it myself. The reason I'm paying you to do it is because I want you to put up with the fact that my truck is a fucking disaster. Also, we were down, have you been down to the farm, Matt? Oh, yeah. You know how it's just Many times. roads everywhere. It, it, was, and, it was flooded. And, and I've gotten brand flats. new. Yeah, I had brand new F1 tires on, just completely bald. Just I had to go at 30 miles an hour or else I'd stop. So this this little shitty lesbian Subaru Forester just going at full we speed. We had to tow your vehicle no, out of a no. knot. No, you never towed the pushed Subaru. It. We didn't tow it. We just pushed no. it. No, no. You're th no, you're thinking of the Jeep. Well, the Jeep died like seven times. The Jeep we towed. The Subaru we just pushed. Uh, you, you, you definitely got the you definitely got you super drunk. stuck and you we had to drunk no you were drunk i have video and photos of your stuck subaru oh, in the lower pit remember no towing subarus is the national sport of wyoming well i don't know he's towed more jeep, towed more of my jeep wrangler than he has of the subaru i'm surprised that was not the fault of jeep run. that was the fault of of <laughs> <laughs> your eyes were bigger than your stomach in terms of like it was just an old sell? jeep yeah, it, was it, a, was a, it was a jeep disaster. at two hundred thousand miles it was time for it to go that thing was about finished yeah regardless i helped but, build that range with the farm yeah yeah i've done a lot of shooting in it recently we did a comp uh we did airsoft i'm i'm, I'm gonna look like a leper victim right now i'm covered in so many fucking um bb holes but uh yeah it's a, it's a cool to, range i used to work for a company called firearms application response management and that was the farm f-a-r-m yeah and i ran the retail part of that you were so close to fart yeah you could have been fart <laughs> i have a you, you fucked up i have a galil management not a good word team very good word training good word could have been training could have been fart you fucked up Yep. I yeah, I push, I help push a Whatever. bunch of Who cares? I've got a lot of lead in that dirt. There's a lot of lead in that dirt. Well, I remember talking to, I think he was one of the owners. He was a... The new owner a, or the old owner? Old owner. Okay. Old owner. But I remember going into their shop in Salt Lake, and they had a super short, I think it was a Remington 700. I thought, oh, that's crazy. Why would you have a barrel that short? And it was a really cool rifle, but like super short barrel in 308. And a yep. can. Signaling. That yeah. was uh that was an AWC Thunder Trap. Oh, okay. On that gun. That was old school AWC cans back then. <clears throat> that was 
timeline when I was there, when Ryan Nell was the one of Ryan, the that's who it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I used to run there. I used to do the outside sales on the LE side and help run the retail store. And then we did a bunch of shit out at the range. So. Yeah. Anytime I went to Salt Lake, that was, that was a mandatory stop. I had to go to the farm. Yep. It was pretty cool while it was there. Yeah. Yeah. We built a sporting clays range out there too, which that was what that, uh, that flat spot on the top of that berm right there is just to put a target thrower on. They ended up putting a shed on it. Oh, okay. Up on the top. Yeah. Yeah. I went through uh handgun instructor and rifle instructor through there. That's back when post required that we had scoped rifles for rifle instructor, which that's been done away with years ago. I've been killed with simunitions many times in that barn. <laughs> a cool range yeah and it was purchased by uh he's a global one global one something like that oh i think i thought it was purchased by someone else just recently because it used to be global one uh thornton he's a he's heavy into i think he bought it heavy into uh scuba diving josh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, heavy, heavy into training. Good guy. I just hope they took a steamroller to the uh, to the front or the the main driveway because I've gotten flat tires due to the sharp rocks. Yeah, that's eating a lot of tires. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Hop and Brass have fallen asleep. We have been going for almost. We are approaching four hours. This has been a lot of fun. Indeed. It's always a good time. Yeah. And I really do think that there could be some a really cool collaboration series of videos. And I, I think you still have multiple kits, including a Galil that I'm really excited about. Yep. They're all still here. Yeah. It's, uh, at the expense of a lot of my personal stuff, all the kits and parts yeah. and thing went into a uh, uh, Connex and you know, more weather tight storage while I was in the process of building and everything. So I lost, I lost a lot of stuff, but all the kits and everything are in good shape yeah. and ready to go. So as soon as I get this place cleaned up a little more and organized and rebuilt and get the rust off everything, then yeah. we'll be getting, working off some of that backlog and getting some more guns built and doing hopefully a lot more shooting. Yeah. Yeah. As time permits. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got a four hour window. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that's up. <laughs> yeah. I could see an armor shoot easily. I could see all kinds of stuff at the Gary Hughes. The what, Casa, what, what, Casa uh, de Gary. What was uh, Michael Jackson's? Oh, Wonderland. Wonder- Ranch. Oh. Was that what it was? No, we just we just call it Red Queen Ranch. It's yeah, the Red Queens. I'm just uh, that's a much better name for it. Yeah, yeah, Red Red Queen Ranch. Cool. Well, since it is getting so late and the the kids are falling asleep, the dog needs to go out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, she's like primed for it. Yeah, she's staged by the door. Let's get some final thoughts, final plugs. Please plug whatever you're representing before we go there, I'll say my favorite thing because we didn't actually have an intro. We just jumped into it. People know who we are. We don't need to do anything. Sit pretty. I am. Not you. The dog. The dog is so much prettier than you could ever hope to be. I know. Look at her. Look at her. What do you want? Oh yeah. What What a good girl. I don't even know where my wants to eat your fingers. Run around somewhere. I think she wants to go out. My stupid fucking cat still got his his grievous burn injury, and he's sleeping in the other room. He looks like a fucking Frankenstein animal. This fucking guy. Well, my favorite thing to say: make sure you support those sources that you have found to be beneficial. We just had almost a four hour discussion. It was awesome stuff. Really good discussions. We even talked about some hipsters. Um. Some atten- hipster what? Yeah, some hipsters. Pay attention hipster to who what? these guys represent, who they are. If you like what they had to say, 
find them on social media, give them likes, give them follows, subscriptions, shares, all that kind of stuff. Um, if they're producing content that's beneficial to you, you should probably share it because otherwise you're kind of being selfish. And if you find good stuff, share it so other people can benefit from it as well. That goes with everything primary and secondary. Again, this has been almost four hours. You've been here the entire time. You should hit, you should probably hit like, you should also share. Gary, what do you have for us for final thoughts, final plugs? Um, well, um, just, uh, we're MOD outfitters. We'll be back up and running soon. We're still been kind of on hiatus because of our construction and building the new shop and everything, but we'll be back soon doing some AK builds and things like that for people and cast bullets and percussion revolver stuff too. And so, yeah. stuff. so we'll be doing a bunch of that. And then uh, red queen ranch is the uh, website. And my wife's got a bunch of stuff and we will be selling um, a lot of kind of specialty ag stuff like grass, grass fed lamb and all that kind of stuff. And Oh, wax and all sorts of fun stuff there. So awesome. Cool. That's good to have you back. Yeah. Brass. Why am I always the second one? Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I'm just going in order yeah. that I'm seeing. Yeah. Counterclockwise. Yeah. Not much to say. I, I run a channel where the, the defining feature is that I don't have the uh, wherewithal or a, a lack of a, or a, a humility to shut the hell up. And then I make videos and that's about the, the extent of it. Uh, I spend most of my effort trying to manage this guy down below. That's about it. <laughs> yes, and I are both like, wait a minute. Oh, I, on mine, I'm in the top right. So. Yeah. No, oh, no. okay. Yeah. No? Okay. No. Here, let me. You just pointed at your crotch. I oh, managed the man in charge down here. There's, He's there's all like, hey. I'm managing that guy as well. What can I say? Yeah, well, he is uh, hard, to, hard to contain, you might wait say. Wait a minute, what? Hey, oh, yeah, where can people find you? Who knows? Internet. 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 Yeah. And how do people subscribe star to you? YouTube.com slash internet. That's right. Hop, send it. And hop? Oh, uh, Jesus. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I hate everything. So the, the trick is to don't watch any of my content because then you'll realize I don't actually hate everything. It's a lot easier if you just pretend I hate everything and don't watch any of it. So do that. It's much more fun. Uh, you can post to Instagram about it. You can post to YouTube about it. You can post to Twitter about or X, whatever it's called now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, X. Yeah, I just, I just don't like anything. I'm just a bad human being. Like I said, there's two different hops. We transitioned at some point tonight, right about when the AK. Talk right, happened. right, because because originally we were, you know, it was real hop who's a nice person, but now we're back to stunt double hop who is a mean person. And it has nothing to do with my level of blood alcohol content. That's just a fucking ridiculous. That's a weird accusation to make. And I'm surprised that you would even bring it up, to be honest. He's sober. You know, he has, he's more uh, partially Mormon, right? I thought you were more drunk. I mean, genetically your... Mormon. Sure. I thought, were, didn't, weren't you drinking more though during airing of grievances? Oh yeah. oh, yeah, much no, significant. No, he didn't drink any. Well, he drank, well, you know, Mountain Dew, but there was nothing That's in true. the mountain. It was just Mountain Yeah, it was just, it I was Mountain I think you were more Dew aggressive tonight than you were with airing of grievances. It really depends on the topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah the topic, like how excited I get about it. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I air into grievances, I don't really have grievances because I'm a nice person and I like everybody. But when they talk about AKs, oh, oh. Get that stunt double. I don't like none of those people. No, you do like the, the stunt doubles. I'm I'm kind of losing track of which guy I am right now, but yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> I'll let you come shoot some real AKs. There you go. Yeah, you know, that might change some. Do you got lasers on them? Do I have what? Do you have lasers on them? No, beams. Beams. Beams? You got to <laughs> call them beams when they're on AKs because they're not real lasers. They're fucking sight mark viz green lasers. Yeah, no, I don't have any of that shit on my guns. All right, so those aren't guns. They're just I mean, toys. I, do have a... I don't know. No, that's it's... cool. That's cool, man. We all got to have toys. Like, I got like a, I have video games over here, which are basically as effective in combat as got, your fucking like... AK. 
There's like a, a mall. mall. Wait, oh, mall. you got a mall? Oh, but it's yeah, not yeah, on yeah. the that's AK. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. Well, that's what we get the tape. So you, you sold guns to buy property, but you didn't sell your fucking mall? No. Jesus Christ. Your priorities are just inverted. I have I have an application for shooting things at night. Not with a mall, you don't. Sure, that's the ER. That's mm. awesome. I mostly use thermal, though. Well, I mean, you don't need me to point out the fact that malls and thermals don't actually work together. There's no... Well, that's why I said I mostly use Nothing thermal. in conjunction there, like... But I do have night mall. vision also. So I've got well, a sure. mall for use with night vision, and I've got a thermal that I use mostly. Are any of the lamps attached to the uh, AKs by chance? Why any would the they be? What's even the point? The, are any of the laser aiming modules attached to the AKs, or are they all in No, but I have killed hogs with a with a maul on a AK. Does that AK exist in the room with us today, or? Uh, it's yeah. You owe me ten bucks if this mall doesn't, or this AK doesn't have a mall on it. Oh no, it doesn't. It doesn't right now. He's off camera right now. He well, now we're three. even. Ah, oh, we fucking got him. No, it doesn't have it on it right now. Yeah, he's okay. Does, so do any of the so AKs it's not have real? A, so it doesn't does, exist. Do any of the so AKs have a laser on it? Yeah. So you no, hallucinated no, he this into existence no. fifteen minutes ago. Oh no, lord, the AKs there it is. Have lasers on them. Yeah, I'll give you. I'll give. I'll give Hop back the ten bucks if you put the uh, the mall on the Don't the forty four. You already owe me ten bucks for the other thing. You yeah, know, yeah, I owe you ten bucks for the other thing. Right, right. so it's twenty ahead. bucks now. Twenty bucks. Damn. These AK gross. people, man, they just can't stop embarrassing themselves. It's it's <laughs> it's really fucking sad to see them be like, no, it's technically better, and you're like, really? And they're like, well, I didn't say it was better. I said, oh, it was I did. I said it was a different tool in the box. Like I'm gonna, it's a worse tool in the box. I'm gonna put this D ball I two, which is broken by the way, on my AK. Is that is a mall? it just it's just resting? It's not a mall, no, because this <laughs> this one's actually affordable and it works. Uh, it, it not only does it hold zero, but you can also buy one on the internet for like a normal amount of money. Yeah. I'm. You don't need to upload this episode. Uh, yeah, I do. But you do need to like. This just needs to be 400 shorts of Hop just going nuts. So you have the normal episode where uh, Gary is, you know, giving useful information. And then it's just, it's just four hours of Hop pissing off the entire Internet, which is actually amazing uh, analytics, by the way. I actually Look. thought that he he seems a lot like Ben Shapiro with about without money. Oh, I've heard that <laughs> too many times. <laughs> I've heard. Uh, what else we got? We got. Uh, Stephen King, of course, that's a that's a classic one. The I used Stephen to wear glasses King one just is, like is Stephen uncanny. King's glasses. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got also my favorite one is uh oh shit, what's his name? The guy uh Wayne LaPierre, the guy who runs the NRA. That guy looks a lot like Stephen King, and I look a lot like Stephen King, so I look a lot like Wayne LaPierre. Uh what else do I get? Uh the guy, the the lead singer of Sisters of Mercy. I get this one all the time. I've never heard of this band, never listened to this band. Apparently, I look just like the guy who fronts the band Sisters of Mercy. I'll look that up. Yeah, you're gonna have to look that up. I I really hope you don't go. Oh, I see it because that'll ruin my fucking night. Okay, Sisters, Sisters of Mercy. Yeah, we're all going. Mercy. God damn. <laughs> lead singer. I assume it's the front man of the band because nobody else would be recognizable by their appearance. He's bald as shit. Well, okay, nowadays, I see it. But what about in the 80s? Try the mm. 80s. Mm. Is it the one that looks like a woman? Hey, that's I think a couple of them do. Going for. It was the 80s. All right, what, what's the NRA, NRA? Wayne LaPierre. Yeah. I don't think he looks anything like Wayne LaPierre. Oh, I I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, he does look like Stephen King. Though people can't tell the two of you apart, so. And yet they On won't let me in to SHOT Show. Every year it's a fight to get invited back to SHOT Show. And I think it's because they look at my picture and they're like, that's, that's just a picture of Wayne LaPierre that you uploaded. It's fraudulent. You're not really a different guy. Do they still sure have Wayne LaPierre to shot show? Actually, I don't know. How does the NSSF get along with the uh, the NRA? 
they have good, like competing shows, right? Like, I don't think they really compete, but I wonder if they just think I'm like a you know an operative. They're like, that's just the NRA trying to sneak into our show again. Don't let that guy in here. Strongly possible. Anyway, this show got like terrible 45 minutes ago. You should probably end it soon. On purpose? Yes, we started sabotaging you and you just didn't realize. That's okay. Oh, yeah, it's the, it's the jawline and the sunglasses. No, I see it. Yeah, you're right. Okay. That's fair. I don't I don't appreciate the comparison, obviously, <laughs> but I do understand it. Uh, all right. Well, I don't care what anyone says. I enjoyed it. I think that was a fun discussion. And also, despite what Brass Facts and Hop have said in the ba- in the past, they don't think I'm going to invite them back. And yet, this is episode three with them. This is the last time you'll see us. <laughs> Release us from our torment. <laughs> That's right. Um, big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordnance. Overwatch, Precision, Filster, Primary Arms, Walther. Lastly, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. What that means is there are all kinds of things going on on primary and secondary, all kinds of resources for your use. If you want to help with that, go to Patreon. It starts at a dollar monthly. It goes all the way up to infinity dollar monthly. Uh, we do have Discord. Discord is constantly moving, constantly going. We have 736 different Facebook groups and 736 different, not really, uh, Discord channels. It's true. If yeah. you support the show, I promise we will not come back. <laughs> no. Um, give Mr. Landfair $1 a month to keep us away from the show. Right. If you don't give him money, we will be back. That is a threat. Yeah. No, I think I think uh, viewers appreciate your guys's input. I do. It's fun to listen to. So uh, you you did a rant, as a matter of fact, in that last episode that was talking like about. Six. Yeah, but there was one specific one where the, the show was being broadcast today, and I even commented in the comments like, "Ooh, good point." And it was something about uh, rounds penetrating someone. And expelling just enough energy just to make the wound. And anything beyond that is a waste of energy. And yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the amazing things about the FBI standards because that's what they're shooting for. And they're doing that. sounds like something I would say, but it also sounds like something I don't remember saying. Oh, no, you said it. It was, it was, I, I, I really liked that. So, um, we do have a couple, we have a bunch of episodes still on the horizon. I just uh, was putting together another episode talking about uh, kind of wilderness survival for the hunter. Have a, a panel slowly come together. Having had, I've had some cool discussions with some some friends that are hunters talking about, well, what happens if you get injured when you're out in the middle of nowhere or the weather automatically changes and you are not prepared We'll talk about that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, we kind of discussed it a little bit in that uh, last wilderness uh, episode just a couple of weeks ago. Still have our uh, explosive one. Still have a couple more episodes. And also have my favorite things episode coming up after July or yeah, January 1st. And basically, it's a year in review. Matter of fact, I think you guys would be good for that. I think that's pretty much everything. I'll end it so I can upload this as soon as possible. So the Patreon subscribers of network support or greater will be able to view it uncut immediately. After that, it will be the edited version that everyone gets to see. Edited doesn't mean though the important content's out. It just means there's a definite start and a finish. This means all those times that Gary said faggot are going to get cut out. No, no, it's all going to be there. It's all there. I was just quoting. Yes. Oh, uh, I, me too. I was just quoting. Yeah. A different, T-Rex just just, yeah, just yeah. don't say hipster. Exactly. That's that's our word, sir. That's right. Okay. So that is all. I'll talk to you later.
Goodbye forever. <laughs> so what's really funny about this after we end is there's the potential for us to still go like six more hours and we I'll did that. stay. We did that once. Yeah. I mean, well, what else are you going to do? I need to pee so fucking bad. I mean, I'll go to the bathroom. I'll grab another beer. I'll go pet my cat. I'll my dog really needs to use some out. commercial that. that for you. Well, you've seen I, her. Look, look at this dog. Look I better her. kill the feed though. Cause I have, it sounds like everyone might be going to bed and yeah. being on the stay shift. Ooh. This is this for me right now. This is, this is late. I'm not used to this already. It's only been a week, but it's, Landfair needs his bedtime. I do. Nappy, nappy. I do. And I got all kinds of family stuff all this weekend. I don't know why. It's not like Christmas is coming or anything. Okay. Well, what was so needy? Fuck. Yeah. I'm going to go shoot a coyote. Nice. Well, are you going to use With an, an AR-15? Yeah, that's good. It will, no, be, it will be an AR-15. God, bl- God bless America. Yep. And thermal? And thermal, most likely. That's cool. Okay. You guys take care. We'll see you later. Later. Bye, Brass. Bye. Bye, Hop. He's he can hear you. He's he's yeah. pissing with muted. Usually you can hear him piss, and it's yeah, it's delightful. Yeah. All right. I'll see I'll see you later. See you later.